Renascore The Rule of Three Book Five The Battle As the crowd thundered in bloodlust, Joseph and Shade approached one another in the center of the arena, dead set on killing each other, and the only thing I could do was sit back and watch. I've known her since she was an adolescent. What right do you think you have to take her away from me? said Joseph as he raised his sword, ready to attack. You think a weakling like you could even think to persuade her into mating with you? <laughs> Pitiful, bellowed Shade as he took his fighting stance. Spectators in attendance looking down in the arena were on the edge of their seats. Both men hissed before they flew at one another, murderous rage in their eyes. I squeezed the dagger in my right hand tightly and watched the two of them go at it. Was my uncle testing my loyalty, or was he indeed that deviant? I didn't know what I was going to do. As much as I resented Joseph for his arrogance and his weakness and his inability to contain his emotions, I didn't think I'd be able to end his life myself. And Shade, I couldn't kill him either. I still had so many questions to ask him. Not to mention the Duke and his plan to ascend me to the throne. If only I had the power of mind thought and could see into the minds of my adversaries. It seemed as if my second day at court would be even more turbulent than the first. Something to drink, my lady, said a servant woman, wearing a see-through light green gown. She placed a glass of blood wine on the table next to me. I couldn't bring myself to drink, or even lift the glass from its place. My eyes were steadfast on the fight in the center of the arena. The servant woman walked past me and offered the empress and duchess a glass as well. Before the servant woman could get too far, however, a young noble sitting next to the duchess grabbed the woman's arm and pulled her onto his lap. They were now blocking my view of the arena. Watching their flirtations, I began to think how their screams would sound if I lashed out at them with this dagger in my hand. The servant woman crossed her legs and ran her fingers through the noble's hair. Will you take me here, in front of everyone? She said. My fangs grew and I gritted my teeth. If you wish, said the noble. He crept his hand up her thigh slowly until he reached her white lace thong. I couldn't believe this crap. Move out of the damn way, I exclaimed. Without bothering to acknowledge me, the noble pointed to the large holographic view screen to the right of us. You can see the fight clearly right there, he said. The emperor turned his head toward me and smiled. The look in his eyes told me that he wanted me to kill this noble for his insolence. Of course, how could I be so blind? I said in a mocking tone. I heard him snicker as he continued to kiss and caress the servant woman. Before he realized what was happening, I stood behind him, took a handful of his coal black hair, and put my dagger right to his neck. The next time your princess gives you a command, you follow it, I bellowed. The empress and her mate laughed, as did the duchess. The young noble sat still, as the servant woman scurried away as fast as she could. The decadence of this court needs reformation, don't you think? I pushed the dagger into the skin on his neck. Y yes my princess, he stuttered. A great battle is taking place, and all you seem to care about are the pleasures of the flesh. Is the fight down there boring you? Blood began to drip from his neck. N no my princess. His stuttering was annoying me. Good. Then pay attention! I slit the upper part of his chest as I pulled the dagger away and released his hair. Such a volcanic temper you have, said the Duchess. I took my seat and sighed. I despise lack of discipline. As do I, said the Emperor. In a flash, the young noble was ejected into the air, high into the clouds until he was gone from our sight. I gazed at the Emperor in shock. His right hand was glowing white and his eyes were blood red. What powers flowed through him? His telekinesis astounded me. Only fate will help him find his way back to the palace, said the emperor. Everyone around him laughed as I focused my attention back to the arena. The holographic presentation of the fight wasn't enough for me. I had to gaze down on them in real time. Swords clashed as the red sun beamed down in the arena, where Joseph and Shade engaged in a heated fight to the death. The UV rays sparked from their weapons with each glow. I was on the edge of my seat. 
I hadn't expected Joseph to put up a good fight against the warrior Shade. It seemed as if his desire for me ran deeper than I could have imagined. He must have been training in secret all these years. Neither had landed a hit, as they parried and dodged each other's strikes and movements. I looked down at the dagger in my hand, and anxiety I'd never felt flushed over my senses. Seeing Joseph fight with such dignity and intensity was weighing on me. I couldn't end his life. I just couldn't. She's mine! screamed Shade, as he brought down his weapon upon his adversary's head. Joseph blocked the strike, and maneuvered out of the way with grace I'd never seen from him. And maneuvered out of the way with grace I'd never seen from him before. No. Athanasia belongs to me. Who are you to challenge 175 years of guardianship? shouted Joseph. He launched at Shade with all he had, his sword swinging above his head. Their swords collided, creating a spark of UV light that exploded between them. The swords in their hands cracked and crumbled to nothing, leaving only the hilts. They flew back as the UV explosion scorched them both. With their faces and hands burned, they staggered to their feet and stared at one another. How far was this going to go? And how long before I would have to end one of their lives? The stress of it made my blood boil. Who do you think will win? The Empress asked the Duchess. I'm not sure. I never thought a guardian would put up such a good fight, the Duchess responded. Both of them turned and gazed at me. Did you train your guardian? Asked the Empress. I tightened my grip on the dagger. Of course not. I don't know where he learned such skills, I said. Seeing as he won the royal challenge, I can only assume he learned from watching your many battles, said the Emperor. The claw on his right index finger tapping away at his cheek. Ha, huh, indeed, said Isadora of Daya from behind me. I turned around and saw her hovering over me in a white silk dress, her green eyes beaming. One could see her perky breasts through her clothes. I was beginning to wonder if it was a requirement for every woman at court to wear dresses and gowns that were see-through. The dress hugged her athletic, yet finely curved body. She walked down the steps and took a seat right next to me. Her fangs were fully extended, as she sat and crossed her pure white legs, revealing her upper thighs. Every man in the section of our balcony gazed at her with lust in his eyes, including the Emperor. The Empress hissed at her mate, seemingly annoyed. The Emperor swiftly averted his eyes and focused his attention back to the arena. I gazed at them both for only a second so as not to draw their attention. That was the first time I'd seen the Emperor flustered. Was my uncle not allowed to touch or even lay eyes on Isadora? I see the Emperor has granted you your wish, said Isadora, as she snatched the dagger from my hand to examine it. What do you mean, my wish? I asked. She ran the point of the dagger up her thigh slowly, as the men around us stared unabashedly. Isadora gazed at her audience and smiled. She knew what she was doing. That's quite cold-blooded of you, sister, said the Empress. I rotated my gaze between the both of them, confused. Not another word, Isadora. Can't you see there's a battle going on? Said the Empress. Isadora giggled and handed the dagger back to me. What the hell is going on? Tell me what you meant by wish, I whispered to her. With her thumb and index finger, she began playing with small strands of her hair. I eyed her thighs and realized she wasn't wearing any panties. As our row was on the top balcony, I was sure every man staring would get a glimpse of everything available to taste. Now I knew why they were all staring at her. Don't tell my sister I told you this, she whispered. I nodded. Well, she told the Emperor that you wanted to make the final kill. To appease you, he allowed you this gift, she said. She did what? I mumbled. My eyes widened and I gritted my teeth. An explode of rage bubbled in my gut. Unbelievable. This was the second time this bitch had told the Emperor of my so-called wishes that I never intended to happen or even wanted. First with the Blood's Passion Ritual, and now this. She would pay for her deceit. My right eye twitched as I tried to contain my anger. By the look on your face, I'm guessing she lied, asked Isadora. I took two deep breaths and leaned back into my chair. Yes. Yes, she did. I said. Isadora laughed and crossed her legs again, revealing her womanly lips to all the men who were lucky enough to see. Here, take this. She handed me a white cloth. To clean your dagger after you make the kill, she said. The dress I was wearing didn't have pockets, 
so I took the cloth and stuffed it into my bosom. I tried to bury, I tried to bury the Empress's deception in the back of my mind, and focus on the ongoing battle between Shade and Joseph. Their wounds from the UV blast had healed, and they were now engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Blood covered Joseph's body, as he blocked and evaded each of Shade's attacks. I could tell Joseph wasn't as proficient in the martial arts as he was with the sword. Joseph didn't stand a chance against Shade with his elite training. There was no room for Joseph to maneuver a counterattack. It seemed Shade had truly been trained in the Red Sun Academy. He moved with grace and brilliance. This fight is over, said the Duchess. I clutched the dagger and watched nervously. The time was near, and my worst fear was becoming a reality. You weakling! shouted Shade, as he roundhouse kicked Joseph in the face with lightning speed. Joseph flew backward from the force of the strike until he hit the force field. Shade's hands shone red and orange until both of his fists were engulfed in flame, and all the spectators, including the Emperor, stood on their feet. Time for you to die! bellowed Shade triumphantly. He flew at Joseph and pummeled him with his fire fists. I sat there, speechless. Did Shade have the same gifts as I did? Could he create and manipulate the elements? There was no way Joseph could stand against that. Looks like your nephew is turning up the heat, so to speak, Isidore said to the Duchess. The Duchess smiled and sipped the blood from her wine glass. This was it. Joseph would soon meet his end by my hand. It's over, you pathetic sub-vampire! Athanasia is mine! screamed Shade with a fiery killer's instinct in his eyes. He pressed his fists together and formed a massive ball of fire. Joseph closed his eyes and accepted his fate. Shade screamed with bloodlust and blasted him in a murderous rage. Ah! cried Joseph. His entire body was consumed in flames. The crowd jumped to their feet and screamed with joy. The fight was over, and Shade was the victor. I expected nothing less, said the Emperor. He turned to me and nodded as I shied away from his glance. The time had come. A soft white glow surrounded my body, lifting me into the air. The next thing I knew, I was in the center of the arena with Joseph and Shade, the dagger in my right hand. This day, a great battle was fought. But as you all know, there can only be one victor. Today, that victor is Shade of Sandiel, shouted the Emperor. The crowd of royals and other spectators roared as I gazed at the lot of them. I didn't want to do this, but thanks to the Emperor's scheming, I had no other choice. As promised, your princess will make the kill, if you so deem it, he said. There wasn't any doubt that this horde of bloodthirsty privileged nobles would want to see death. It was evident by their chance. Kill! 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 the crowd repeated. I looked around and Shade was gone. The Emperor had ferried him up to the balcony next to the Duchess. It was just Joseph, the dagger, and me. I stared down at Joseph's body. His hair and clothes were utterly charred off, and his skin was black and bloody. He lay there, broken and defeated, waiting for death. Every holographic screen within the arena was plastered with my image. The whole Empire was waiting for me to make the kill just like before. The time had come, and death would befall him. Useful Sacrifice Do it, Athanasia. End my suffering, he said, through the pain. I closed my eyes and cleared my mind to black out the chanting crowd. This wasn't going to happen the way they'd expect, and I wasn't going to play this game the Empress had laid before me. My guardian would live. I controlled my fate. I alone made my decisions. Kill him, Athanasia! Kill him! Yelled the Empress from the royal balcony. As Joseph struggled to breathe, I knelt and put my arm under his head. I used the dagger to slit my wrist before tossing it to the ground. Blood ran down my arm, and I placed my wrist to Joseph's lips. Drink, I said. What? I said drink. I commanded. Without another word, he grabbed my arm and allowed my essence to flow into his mouth. Everyone stared at us, dumbfounded. The Empress was visibly pissed, but I didn't care. This was her doing anyway. 
You insult our traditions, exclaimed the emperor. After a few mouthfuls, I dropped Joseph to the ground and stood in defiance. This court wasn't going to control me. Not now, not ever. Explain yourself, Princess Athanasia, demanded the emperor. My wrist healed quickly, and I wiped the remaining blood from my arm onto my bosom. With my blood flowing through him, Joseph's hair grew back. His skin was healed as well. It would take time for all his wounds to heal, but as long as he was alive, I was grateful. I am the princess of all that I survey, and I now ask the Crimson Asa court to spare my guardian. He displayed great honor and courage in this arena today. His life is worth saving. In return for your mercy, I will lead our forces to the planet Gala. I believe I've earned that right, I proclaimed. I could almost hear the Empress sneer from where I stood. Is that what you truly wish? asked the Emperor. Yes, uncle. I want revenge for what they did to my father. He smiled and nodded. Then so be it. Joseph Vaka Yukau, you are spared the fate of death. You are hereby demoted from guardian to vagabond. You must earn the right to be called a guardian if you wish to live among the nobility. You will return to Yaxtaya until you've earned back your honor. You are forbidden from taking revenge for what happened this day. In doing so, you will have forfeited your life, declared the Emperor. I turned my attention to Joseph. The smell of his burning clothes and skin was repugnant, but I was thankful the Emperor agreed with my sentiments. As much as I resented Joseph for showing such weakness during my ritual, I didn't want to see him perish. I had known Joseph for my entire 200 years, and to do without him after so long was unacceptable. You have damned me to a life as a vagabond. You should have just let me die, he whispered with his head down. Excuse me? I whispered back. Death is preferable to life as a vagabond. I will be without honor or a home for the rest of my days. I picked the dagger up from the ground and squeezed it in my palm. At least as a vagabond, you'll have the chance to earn your honor back. What good could honor do you dead? I hissed. The audacity of him. On second thought, what are you doing? He asked as I knelt and put the dagger to his neck. The entire kingdom, as well as the emperor, looked down on us confused. Are you saying you want me to kill you now so you can die with honor? Is that what you want? I said into his scorched ear. I thought you wanted him to live, said the emperor, laughing. Everyone in the arena chuckled as well. I pressed the dagger harder against his skin, waiting for an answer. Athanasia, please. Once again, I'm here cleaning your mess. And you have the nerve to begrudge me for it? If you want to die, then just give the word, Joseph. Give the word. Make up your mind, woman, shouted the empress. All right, I want to live. He grabbed my wrist and looked at me with teary eyes. I released his head and removed the dagger from his neck. I thought so, I stated, as I wiped the blade with a white cloth given to me by Isadora. What is your wish, princess? asked the emperor. I gazed at them and smirked. He lives, I shouted. The empress scoffed and rolled her eyes. What did she have against Joseph? He was nothing to her. Perhaps her goal was to see me suffer. Or maybe she was pissed I'd outwitted her. Either way, I couldn't care less. And so, Princess Athanasia, you will lead the first wave of our forces to the planet Gala. Are you sure that's what you want? asked the Emperor. Without flinching, I held the dagger between my eyes and threw it to the ground. More than anything, you will be the shortest lived princess in the history of our empire! bellowed Shade, to everyone's shock. The holographic projections and view screens focused on him. Know your place, Shade, said the Duchess. Do you doubt her skills in battle? asked the Empress. My mate's battle skills are unmatched, but an attack of this magnitude will no doubt claim her life, said Shade. Your mate? I wasn't aware you took a mate, Princess, said the Emperor. I shook my head. He's getting a bit ahead of himself, Uncle. I have yet to claim a mate, as I've told him on numerous occasions. He has yet to prove his worth, I said. The Duchess grabbed Shade by the waistline of his pants and sat him down next to her. Don't second guess your princess's wishes. She has made her desires known, and you will honor them, she said to Shade. His worried eyes were locked on mine, 
It was then I realized just how much he cared for me. How could this be? Love was an illusion, a system of control. There was no feasible way he could love me. I lowered my gaze, breaking eye contact with him. I needed to focus on the battle to come. Love was the last thing I'd need in my life. War was coming, and after decades, I'd finally have the opportunity to avenge my father's death. Gala would fall tonight, and forever. Five armed guards appeared from the cages beneath the arena and surrounded me. They bowed before me and lowered their weapons. My princess, please allow us to escort Joseph back to Yaxtaya. His time in the arena has ended, said the head guard. His uniform was shining gold, as opposed to those of the others who were all draped in black. I stepped aside and let them take my former guardian. While his skin was healed, Joseph's clothes were all but ash, and his body was worn. He needed to feed. A white light engulfed my body, and I soon found myself back on the balcony, standing next to the Duchess in shade. I looked over and saw some brutish-looking ancient royal sitting in my chair next to Isadora, her legs resting on his lap. Princess Athanasia, since you've elected to lead the first wave of our forces into battle, I'll allow you to choose when the attack occurs. Do you still wish it for tonight? Or would you rather wait for the solar eclipse of their world, where they'll be the most vulnerable? Asked the Emperor. The spotlights from the holographic projectors were on me. Everyone in the Empire awaited my decision. I gazed right into the spotlights, unwavering as the anticipation grew. Tomorrow night. We will conquer tomorrow night. Today's festivities still need to be enjoyed. Let the Empire feast and celebrate. For tomorrow, we end Gala's reign of resistance. The Emperor smiled and gazed back at Isadora for a brief moment. That subtle glance wasn't lost on the Empress, however, as I could sense the jealousy in her eyes. Your princess has spoken. Celebrate and feed as much as your blood desires. For tomorrow, we dance toward universal dominance, decreed the Emperor. The arena erupted in cheers. My uncle continued to steal glances at Isadora while ignoring his mate's growing jealousy. With her legs propped up on that royal's lap, one could see just about everything she had to offer. It puzzled me that my auntie would be jealous of her sister, and not every other female the Emperor had taken into his bed, including the Duchess. This court was full of secrets. You've doomed yourself, whispered Shade from behind me. I spun around and eyed him up and down, dismissively. Don't worry about me. You should worry about yourself after you've finished embarrassing the both of us, I hissed. He backed away, confused. In what way did I embarrass you? Presuming we're mates and blurting it out in front of the entire kingdom. Get one thing straight, Shade. We are not mates. And if you continue to let your tongue speak before your mind can gather thoughts, then you and I will never be mates, I whispered sternly. He grabbed my arm. Why are you fighting me? I felt it in your blood during the ritual. I know how I make you feel. His eyes were glowing light blue with passion. I told you before, love is for fools. Then let us be fools together, he whispered. I looked and noticed everyone within eyes view was staring at us. So much for not making a scene. Are you sure you're not mates? Because you sure do behave like a couple, said the Empress as everyone laughed. I rolled my eyes and shook my head. We'll talk about this later. There's someone I'd like to see before it's too late, I said. Anger overcame Shade's face, and I assumed he knew who I was referring to. Very well, princess. He bowed and stepped aside. The crowd began to exit the arena. As I walked away, I realized something that hadn't occurred to me until now. The Duke was nowhere in sight. His mate, Duchess Sela, was here, but he wasn't. Given the conversation the Empress and I had before the fight, it made me wonder why he was absent. What if they knew? Quite the display you put on out there. You should take pride in saving your guardian's life, said the Empress. I stopped in my tracks, turned around, and made my way toward her. We stared at each other for a moment. I bent over and positioned my lips close to her ear. I know you orchestrated this the same way you did with the ritual. If I were you, I'd focus my attention on more important things, such as my uncle and your sister, I whispered. Her fangs grew when she realized the Emperor had migrated away from us and next to Isadora. Desire had a hold of him. There was no doubt Isadora was emitting her lust influence. 
This bitch is asking to get her ass handed to her, my auntie sneered. With vampiric speed, the Empress came in between the Emperor and her sister, her eyes burning with jealousy. Come, Magnus, we have things to do, she said to the Emperor, all while giving her sister a death glare. Leaving so soon, Isidora said with a conceited grin. The Empress's fangs grew longer, and the rage on her face intensified. What exactly was Isidora up to? You're right, Ophelia. We have important matters to attend to. The Emperor stood as he continued to gaze at Isidora's long, silky legs. I'll see you soon, Isidora said with a smirk. The Emperor smiled and left the arena with the Empress. Was everyone at court a damn sex addict? Do you mind if I accompany you? said the Duchess. I looked at her confused. Accompany me where? You're going to see Joseph off, aren't you? Do you mind if I tag along? There are things I'd love to talk to you about. Her skin was so luminescent that it filled my blood with warmth. She was her own enchanted star. Thank you, but no. I want to be alone with Joseph before he leaves, I said. Suddenly, a loud snap echoed around us. I looked down at Shade. He was sitting in his chair, with two pieces of the hilt of his UV sword at his feet. His hands were shaking, and his eyes glowed with fury. Are you alright? The Duchess asked him. He stood, dusted off his hands, and looked directly at me. If he touches you, I'll kill him, he threatened. Without saying another word, he pushed the Duchess and me aside and stormed toward the exit. Erratic emotions, the Duchess snickered. My brow wrinkled, and I crossed my arms. Shade and I would have a long conversation later. How he'd fallen in love with me with such intensity mystified me. The ways of the vampire mystified me. I'd fought them for so long that maybe I didn't know the power of emotions could run so deeply. I needed guidance. My ignorance on the subject was what had led Joseph to do what he'd done. I'd never thought he would react that way. And I'd never thought Shade would be so furious at the very mention of me being alone with him. If I were going to survive at court, I had to learn the ways of the vampire. The ways of desire and love. The last thing I wanted was for Shade to attack someone who ranked higher in the vampire hierarchy, and potentially put himself, or me, in danger. The Duchess began to caress my shoulder. Euphoria immersed with that single touch, and all my worries vanished. What do you say we meet up after? She asked. Yes, yes. I answered, without thinking. She placed both of her hands on me. My body shivered. I'd never felt anything like this before. Let her go, Scylla. She's not trained in the ways of the vampire to handle that level of lust influence, said Isadora. The Duchess released me and I dropped to my knees. You're always meddling in my affairs. Why don't you focus on the Emperor? Everyone knows you've been trying to fuck him for the better half of the last 500 years, said the Duchess. I ran my hands through my hair and gathered my bearings. What the hell was that? I exclaimed through my panting. Like all vampires, I have the gift of lust influence. However, mine is far more potent than that of any other vampire in the cosmos. I call it euphoria influence, said the Duchess. I stood upright with my fangs extended. Ask before doing that again, I said sternly. She giggled. As you wish. I gave a firm look to her and Isadora before making my way toward the exit. This court was going to turn my hair gray. Tug of War The guards dragged my defeated, broken, and undone ex-guardian through the halls of the palace. As I watched the frailty of what had become after the battle, I couldn't help but think that maybe he was right. Life as a vagabond for someone who dwelled within the protections and privileges of royalty all their life would be dooming. His way of life would change entirely, and he'd need to adapt to survive. I briskly walked up to them and headed them off. Joseph had his head down, and he refused to walk on his own. The guards had been carrying him by his arms as one would an inanimate object. I stood in front of them and crossed my arms, blocking their path. Leave him, I commanded. My princess? Asked the guard to my left. I said leave him. I'll take it from here. They looked at each other confused, but nonetheless complied with my order. 
The guard to my left released his arm while the other slowly placed him on the floor. And they bowed and journeyed back the way they'd come. I scrutinized Joseph's unwillingness to walk on his own and shook my head. Get up, I ordered. I can't. I've lost the will to. Get up, or I'll finish what I started in that arena. You've partially healed already, and you can stand on your own two feet. Don't make me ask again. Weakness in all its forms aggravated me. What he'd experienced at the hands of Shade was nothing compared to what I'd been through at the Red Sun Academy. And in battle, I'd been through far worse. What's the point? Just finish me off. I've lost everything. My title, my rank, and my place at your side. I rolled my eyes and squatted in front of him. Look at me, I said. His face was planted on the floor, as he lay, sprawled on the red and black carpet. I put my hand under his chin and lifted his head so he could look at me. If you don't get up right now, I'll let Shade take me right here in front of you, I threatened. His eyes turned red, and he sat up with purpose. Do you take pleasure in tormenting me? You've known me for almost my entire two centuries. You should know that tormenting you is one of my favorite pastimes. I smiled to lighten the mood. He held his head low. Why did you ask the Emperor to spare me? If you hate me so much, why not let your new lover end me? I'm the past. He's your future. I sat on the floor next to him and pulled my legs into my chest. We can discuss this here on the floor, or we can discuss it in my chambers. The last thing I wanted was for someone at court to see me talking to him openly after such a crushing defeat. Showing my former guardian favor probably wouldn't sit well. I needed to remain neutral in the eyes of the court. He looked at me with doe eyes. Your chambers? Yes, damn it, my chambers. What is wrong with you? Stop soaking in self-pity and get up. You should be grateful you're still alive. Take honor in that. If you had perished in that arena, your name, your deeds, all of it would have been erased. He sighed and continued to wallow in his defeat. Are you going to get up and come with me to my quarters or just sit here forever? I pressed. All right, let's go, he finally said. I glanced down the hallway and saw Shade approaching with Isadora. I jumped to my feet and took Joseph by the hand. This way, I said. I tried to avoid eye contact with Shade as we scurried down the hall. The last thing I wanted was for him to snap again. Wait, said Joseph, as he stopped midway down the hallway. I could still see Shade in the distance, and it looked as if he'd caught a glimpse of us. What? Would you come on? I bellowed. I glanced up again and saw Shade marching toward us, jealous fury in his eyes. His possessiveness was wearing on me. I'd have to put a stop to it sooner rather than later. I need to know something, said Joseph. What is it? I asked impatiently. Do you still care about me? I gritted my teeth and tried to keep my fangs from growing. The jealousy and emotional sentiments from Joseph and Shade were driving me insane. Yes, I care about you. Now would you come the hell on? I shouted. Shade drew near, and I could tell he was about to go crazy yet again. If he touches you! Screamed Shade from down the hallway. Various nobles and servants flinched at the tone of his voice. And suddenly, all eyes were on Joseph and me. This was getting ridiculous. I grabbed Joseph by the arm and pulled him behind me. Shade was only a few steps away when I summoned my gifts. My hands illuminated with a red and gold aura, and my body shone neon violet. Shade stopped advancing and stared at me, shocked. Everyone in the hallway stared at us, waiting to see what I would do. I held my left hand in front of me, right in the direction of Shade. What are you doing? asked Joseph. I focused more energy into my palms. Giving a lesson in boundaries, I retorted. Shade held his hands up and backed away. Whoa, calm down, Athanasia, he said. I slowly walked toward him, the aura around my body intensifying. I belong to no one. I will speak to whomever I choose to speak to. I'll also touch any man or woman I choose to touch. If you think I'm one of your possessions, then you're sadly mistaken. A ball of fire and ice emanated from my palm. 
Whatever you're thinking of doing, Athanasia, don't do it, said Isadora. She was standing about five feet behind Shade. Well out of my line of fire. He's bringing this on himself. If he thinks I'm his property, then I'll show him just how hazardous keeping me can be. The ball of fire and ice grew to the size of my torso. Shade smiled. I don't think you have it in you to hit me with that. I launched the orb directly at him before he could say another word. The ball of elements hit him center mass. He screamed in pain and went flying out the way he'd come. Through the door, off the balcony, until he crashed in the center of the arena. A loud explosion echoed around the palace, as flames and snow shot in every direction. Isadora stood there, flabbergasted, as did everyone else who witnessed it. What have you done? screamed the Duchess, who stood at the doorway of the balcony. I swiped my hands and turned back on everyone. Pain is one of the only virtues that anyone truly remembers. He will remember this pain the next time he tries to fight every man I talk to, I said without regret. The Duchess and Isadora ran outside onto the balcony. They looked down and gasped before jumping into the arena to check on him. I was confident he was okay. We'd taken a much more powerful blast at the Red Sun Academy, and if he were a graduate, he'd be fine within a few hours. I gazed at Joseph, who stood there, gaping. My powers had increased to a level he'd never seen before. I supposed it was in my best interest to learn to control them. Princess Athanasia! shouted the Empress from further down the hall. She stormed toward me, accompanied by two guards. Joseph stepped aside and bowed. Yes, Auntie, I said with a smile. She grabbed me by my arm and hissed. We do not use our powers within the court, especially against others of royal blood, she growled. I shrugged. That man has been pursuing me relentlessly since the blood's passion ritual. He's driving me nuts, I responded. The Empress dug her claws into me and pulled me right up against her. We have rules. Don't think you are above them, she said, with her fangs displayed. Wasn't it you who told me not to allow any man to fall in love with me? Shade's obsession almost triggered another fight with Joseph. I couldn't let them fight again after I asked the Emperor to spare Joseph. And don't think I've forgotten about your little deception. Telling the Emperor I wanted to make the final kill, I said. How did you know what I told my mate? She asked suspiciously. Isadora had told me to keep my lips sealed about it, but I was already frustrated with this whole ordeal. To be honest, I didn't care to explain it to her anyway. I snatched my arm out of her grip and took a few steps back. It doesn't matter how I know. The fact is, Empress, I eyed her up and down. I don't appreciate being manipulated. Her eyes turned dark blue and her fangs retracted. We'll discuss this later. In the meantime, you will confine yourself to your room until the council is notified. She turned to walk away, but I hopped in front of her. The council? I inquired. The Empress ran her fingers through a few strands of my hair and grinned. You really should have studied coven politics and imperial spatial rule while you were at the academy. 150 years in the field, and you know so very little about our governing bodies, she said. My brows curled and I looked at her with confusion. What governing bodies could a kingdom that's ruled by an absolute monarch have? I asked. The Empress sighed. The Crimson Council is the disciplinary board within the court. They judge royals and nobles who have transgressed against their peers, she explained. I haven't transgressed against anyone, I protested. Athanasia, you just shot the heir to the planet Sandiel through the doors of the balcony and into the arena, I sneered. But he had it coming, damn it! He won't stop with his obsession! Her fangs grew. Don't pretend as if you don't enjoy it. I've seen the way you look at each other. You'd be more than willing to take him again at court if beckoned. I flinched, and my jaw dropped. How dare you assume? Oh, knock it off, Athanasia. I can sense the passion in your blood. You want him just as much as he wants you. Why are you fighting this connection you have with him so vehemently? She asked. Because she believes love is for fools, said Joseph. I opened my eyes wider and turned my death glare on him. Is that so, my little niece? Love is a potent emotion. I wouldn't say it's for fools, said the Empress. I know what I said, Athanasia. Nevertheless, you shouldn't dismiss the emotion entirely. 
It's illogical to pretend that love doesn't exist. Don't deny it. Use it, she advised. I held my head low and took a few deep breaths. Listen, you're still relatively young, and I doubt you've had much experience in controlling your emotions outside of what the Academy has taught you. Know this. Instead of trying to crush this obsessive love Shade has for you, maybe you should try using it. I looked into her eyes. In what way can I use it? She flicked her hair and smiled. Make him do for you what no other would be willing to do. Embrace him, and he'll kill and die for you with just the slightest nod of your head. How do you think I was able to court your uncle and become the empress of our empire? I looked at Joseph, and he bowed, turning his gaze to the floor. In any event, you still have to be judged by the council for what you did to him. You could have just slapped or kicked him, you know. You didn't have to blast him, she said. Five more guards came marching down the hallway with UV guns. My princess, we're here to escort you to your quarters, said the stocky muscular guard in the front of the formation. I sighed in frustration and crossed my arms. Just go with them. I'll summon you when judgment has been passed, she said. I let my arms fall to my side and consented. I wasn't used to such fragilities and rules. At the academy and in the field, things such as what I'd done were just commonplace and no big deal. One little blast and everyone loses their minds. This was insanity. As I walked with the guards, the Empress sidestepped me and grabbed Joseph's arm. You come with me, Vagabond, she commanded. Her eyes glowed red, and I knew what that look on her face meant. What do you want with my guardian? I took hold of Joseph's other hand. He's not your guardian anymore. What happens to him is none of your concern. She pulled him along and out of my grip. The lust in her eyes was evident. She would kill him the same way she did that bather. I pushed the guards out of the way and ran in front of her, blocking her path. The Emperor's orders were for him to return to Yaxtaya, so whatever you're planning on doing with him can wait until he's completed his penance. I wanted to speak with him before he left, so please unhand him. He's coming with me. I grabbed his arm again and pulled him away from her. I suddenly found myself in a tugging match as she pulls him back toward her. We each had a grip on his wrist as we continued to tug him in opposite directions. You're going to rip me apart! Stop this! Joseph shouted. The Empress's fangs extended as the bloodlust grew within her. I had no idea why she wanted him dead, but I wouldn't allow it to happen. I will feast on him, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. I'm your Imperial Matriarch! You will hand him over to me, she bellowed. <laughs> the truth finally comes out. Was that the reason you lied and told the Emperor that I wanted to make the kill? Why do you want death to befall my guardian? I shouted. I think I know why, said Joseph. You shut your mouth, vagabond, said the Empress. No, I won't. I've been silent for far too long. Now that I'm a vagabond, I have nothing left to lose. By having her take my life, you would have sealed my lips forever. It doesn't matter now anyway. I was going to tell her as soon as she became the Imperial Princess, he said. The Empress pulled his wrist harder, digging her claws into him. Athanasia, listen to me. I know who- Before he could utter another word, two of the guards tackled me, and I lost my grip on him. I looked up and saw the other three guards carry the Empress and Joseph away. What the hell? I hissed. The two who'd tackled me released me quickly, and dropped to one knee. We're sorry, Princess, but it is our duty to ensure royals as high-ranking as you and the Empress do not engage in combat of any kind. We had no choice but to separate the two of you, one of the guards said. I shot to my feet and looked around frantically. She was going to kill him. That much I knew. What the hell did Joseph mean about being silent for so long? Had he been keeping secrets from me? My princess, please allow us to escort you to your room, said the stocky guard. I wiped my brow with the cloth meant for the dagger and stuffed it back into my bosom. Listen, I can get to my room on my own. Both of you go and find Joseph and bring him to me immediately, I ordered. They looked at each other and then at me. But my princess, the empress has... Why the hell are you still here? Go and find him, now, I shouted. They flinched and gave one last glance at one another before running in the direction where the Empress and Joseph had been taken. 
First, it was Shade and the Duke with their secrets. And now, Joseph. I wasn't going to be played for a fool. Nor was I to be a tool for someone else's ambitions. I needed Joseph with me as soon as possible. Marchioness of Aswago. My lady, said a servant woman at the foot of my bed. I'd been waiting in my quarters for so long that I dozed off after finishing a bottle of blood wine by myself. All kinds of questions were buzzing in my head. I detested secrets and deception more than anything, and since being here at court, I'd realized everyone seemed to be well saturated in them. I sat up and crossed my legs. The servant woman was wearing a black silk dress that matched her long, dark hair, which weaved down her backside. I'd never seen her before at court. She must have been new. My princess, I'm here to escort you to your judgment. The council and the emperor await our arrival, she said in a sweet, innocent voice. Her eyes told me just how virtuous she was. I climbed out of bed and proceeded to my closet. The artisans and architects had done an excellent job of restoring my room after Shade and his uncle destroyed all the walls. It appeared brand new. I removed the dress I had fallen asleep in and browsed through my closet for something new. The servant woman was still standing by my bed. Do I have to wear something special for this occasion? I asked her. She smiled and lowered her gaze. You can wear anything your heart desires, as long as it's elegant. I nodded slightly. If you don't mind me asking, what did you do to be put forth for judgment by the council? She sat on my bed and crossed her legs. Her smooth brown skin reminded me of the other servant woman who'd assisted me during the ritual the other day. I'd never been around so many beautiful people, and I had yet to see anyone here who wasn't pleasing on the eyes. I dropped my dress to the floor and found something that would suit the occasion in the very back of my closet. This would be perfect. Tight black leather pants and a white crop top with lace that wrapped around my midsection. I was done with dresses for today. And with vampirses inside these walls walking around semi-nude, this would be fitting for whatever the hell judgment they'd planned for me. I squeezed my ass into the pants and removed my bra. You want to know what I did? I asked her. She nodded enthusiastically. I blasted shade of Sandiel into the next week. She gaped and tried to hide her smile. That was you who did that? Didn't you and he perform the ritual together? I put on my shirt. Yes, we did. Why'd you blast him? I thought he was your mate. Or at least that's what I heard during the fight earlier today. She crossed her legs again, and I saw she wasn't wearing panties. Was that the fashion trend here or something? I ignored it and sat on the opposite side of the bed to strap on a pair of black leather boots I'd found in my other closet. He isn't my mate. By the way, what is your name? Do you often express yourself so nonchalantly with royals? I asked. Confusion and a hint of anger overcame her face. I am a royal. You didn't think I was a servant, did you? I gawked at her and felt a little embarrassed. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. If it weren't for that fight between Shade and his uncle, I would have been able to accept my gifts and mingle during my debut. Unfortunately, I didn't get that chance. Forgive me if I'm not familiar with all the nobles and royals at court as of yet, I said. She shuffled herself closer to me and shrugged. It's not a problem. I've heard how daunting things can get around here. She stood and held her hand out. My name is Elisa Betta. You can call me Elisa. I'm the Marchioness of Aswago and the Lady of the Crimson Council. I put my hand in hers, and she kissed the back of my fingers. Did you say Aswago? Isn't that one of the moons gifted to me by the Emperor? I asked. Yes, my former mate administered the colonies there before he was killed. I was preparing for the Emperor to appoint me Warden of Aswago, but he gifted it to you instead. I took back my hand and finished lacing my boots. You're not upset about that, are you? Not in the least. I have no will to rule or manage colonies, moons, or kingdoms. You're a blessing in disguise, she assured me. So, I suppose you being the Lady of the Council is the reason they sent you to escort me? She sat back down on the bed and surveyed me from head to toe. As I gazed at her after strapping my boots on, I couldn't help but wonder why she of all people would choose to administrate the council when she had an entire moon as her kingdom. Her emerald eyes offset the beauty of her soft, innocent face. I could tell she'd never seen battle, and the pureness of her skin told me she'd probably been pampered all her life. The Emperor asked me to come fetch you. I have no say in the judgments of the Council. 
My responsibilities fall within the realm of keeping things orderly and coordinating cases. Your case, however, is the first one we've had in over a year, she said. I stood from the bed and glanced at myself in the mirror near my closet. Lucky me, I joked. She laughed and headed towards the door. It was funny that I didn't feel the least bit nervous about going to this council to hear whatever judgment they'd lay at my feet. I was the Imperial Princess, after all, and I did have a war to wage tomorrow. If Shade couldn't withstand a simple low-level blast like the one I'd given him, then he wasn't worthy of being my mate. This whole debacle was further proof that I belonged on the battlefield, and not caged up within these decadent walls. You know, my lady, I wasn't going to say anything, but... Do you think that is proper attire to wear before the council? She asked. I looked down at myself, shrugged, and walked out the door of my room. What's wrong with this? She crossed one arm over her bosom, and rested the elbow of the other on her hand as she tapped her cheek with her index finger. I stopped walking when I noticed her eyeing me up and down, as if I'd committed some unwritten crime. You really should change, she said. Why? There's nothing wrong with what I'm wearing. It's much more comfortable than those see-through dresses all the women around here seem to wear. By the way, is that a requirement or just a fashion trend at the moment? I continued to walk, but she stood in front of me, grabbed my wrist, and spun me around. The warrior class should learn to have more etiquette. She scoffed at me and pushed me back into my room. You're not on some distant planet fighting other combatants like yourself anymore, princess. You're in the Crimson Asa court, and the ways of the vampire are held in the highest esteem here. To disrespect our ways is to disrespect everything that we are. Now, please, change into something more respectable if you don't mind, she said, as if it were in order. I said nothing as she tossed me onto the bed and went into my closet. The audacity of it all had me speechless. Who did she think she was? Ah, yes, this will do perfectly. She waltzed out of my closet with a bright smile, holding a neon pink dress that would no doubt reveal the imprint of every curve my body had. I had avoided that dress like an intergalactic contagion, but for some reason, she went straight for it. I'm not wearing that, I protested. She tossed the dress onto the bed right next to me, and crossed her arms over her chest. I have other reasons for coming here, princess. With her long legs, she paced back and forth, never taking her eyes off of me. I didn't want to mention this, but I can sense you're going to be stubborn about this whole process. As I watched her pace, I realized that my body was glowing white and blue. I suddenly found myself floating in the air, my limbs extended outward. Don't make this any more difficult than it has to be, she warned. Whatever energy she had me encased in was potent, because no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't break free. My boots shut off my feet, and my pants fell away into dust. The crop top I was wearing unlaced itself and fell to the bed. I was drifting in the air in my panties alone. How dare she do this to me? You'll look much more pleasing to the eye in this dress, my lady. That pink disaster hovered above me. Closer and closer. Oh yes, she was going to get it the second I was free. Above my head, the dress dangled until it slipped onto my body gracefully. Pink and white marble high heels that just looked rigid and uncomfortable as hell had come out of nowhere and pushed themselves onto my feet. My fangs grew at the thought of drinking a pint from her the moment she released me from this paralysis. I slowly glided down to the bed, and the white and blue glow dissipated from my body. I was ready to sink my fangs into her. Now, before you decide to attack me for what I just did, know that I was acting under the orders of your uncle. I growled. So, the Emperor ordered you to strip my clothes from me against my will? I asked with my fangs at the ready. He asked me to ensure you were dressed properly. And like I said before, I have other reasons for coming here. And what other reasons are those? When the council first asked me to escort you, I inquired as to why you couldn't just make your way down here yourself. That was when the Empress and her sister, Countess Isadora, requested of me a personal favor. What favor? My blood was heated. That I teach you how to be a lady of the court. You've been a warrior for so long, you have no idea how to dress and behave like a princess. I also heard that you and the Empress got into a tussle not too long ago. As princess, you must learn proper restraint and etiquette. Blasting shade out of the palace is not how a princess behaves. I sat there, dumbfounded. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. 
Since I'd been at court, not one high-ranking royal vampiress had behaved with proper etiquette. The entire place seemed to be full of raging sex addicts whose only care was whom they would be able to taste next. What world was this Marchioness living in? She took my hand and bowed slightly. Now, let us head down to the council for your judgment. Afterward, we can have a little discussion as to how we'll proceed with your etiquette lessons. I snatched my hand away and stood there, confused and frustrated. I'm not taking etiquette lessons. Are you mad? Have you lost what little sense you have? You must be as naive as you look. Observe and smell the sex in the air, woman. Proper etiquette doesn't exist around here, I exclaimed. What are you talking about? The court is a beacon of etiquette within the Empire, she said. I gazed into her bright green eyes to get a read on what was going through her head. The Marchioness didn't look insane, and I was sure she wasn't blind. There could only be one other explanation. Excuse me, Elisa, but how long have you been at court? I asked with suspicion. She held her palms up and shrugged. I don't dwell within the court. I live on Oswago. I just got here a few hours ago. Being the lady of the council, I was summoned when the council was in session, thanks to you. Wait, so you don't even live on Vampiraya, let alone in the palace? No, my home is Oswago. I only come here when the council is in session. So, you've never actually taken a place within the court? I asked again, just to be sure. I come here maybe once every few years. Why do you ask? Her expression was one of cluelessness. I placed my hand on my brow and shook my head. That explained everything. The Marchioness of Eswaga would taste everything I'd endured in my many days of being here. I smiled and took her hands in mine. I invite you to stay at court for a while to see its true nature. As the ruler of Eswago, you are not to return home until you've soaked in all the pleasures the court has to offer. You're a widow, so that shouldn't be a difficult task for you to accomplish. Perhaps you can have a little chat with the Duke of Sandiel right before a shower. In the meantime, I do not need lessons from you. I have a planet to conquer tomorrow night. We gazed at each other for a moment surveying one another's eyes. Within the vampire world, one could sense the window of emotions through the eyes. I could tell she didn't possess the power of mind thought. Otherwise, she'd be able to detect what I was about to do. She'd also know precisely what game the Empress and her sister were playing when they assigned her to teach me how to be a princess. I knew what they were up to, and their plan would fall flat. It isn't becoming of a princess to go fighting wars on the front lines. I suggest you cancel whatever plans you have to conquer so that you can stay here with me. I'll teach you everything you need to know about ruling as a matriarch. I curled my lips and stood there staring at her, speechless. Her ill-informed suggestions were annoying me to the point of eruption. Then again, I had to remember that she hadn't been there for the battle between Shade and Joseph, and I wasn't sure if she'd been watching from the comfort of her palace in Eswago. If she had... I was sure she'd known what I'd risk to keep Joseph and Shade alive. We can discuss all this later. We're going to be late for your judgment. I'm sure the Emperor and the others are growing restless. She tried to loop her arm in mine, but I pulled away. Something didn't seem right. What's wrong? She asked. Did you see the battle in the arena today? She'd better say yes. I'm afraid I didn't. I'm not too fond of watching bloodshed between vampires. I gasped in disbelief. So you have no idea what happened, and what I asked of the Emperor? How could you ask me to abandon everything I've worked toward my whole life for etiquette lessons? I pricked my right forearm with my fangs, and held it up to her mouth. Drink, I ordered. We don't have time for this, Princess, she objected. There's a reason the Empress sent you to me. She plans to nullify me, so I'll be obedient. The Empress doesn't want me to find out about what Joseph had to say. Now drink. I demanded. She shook her head. What can be gained by my drinking your blood? I know everything I need to know about your situation. I sneered. You didn't even know the reason I was put up for judgment. Now hurry up and drink before the wound heals. Fine. She scoffed and took my arm into her mouth. The sharp but delicate touch of her fangs drew me in as she began to drink. A powerful lust overcame me as her saliva entered my bloodstream. The lust influence in her was intoxicating, unlike anything I'd ever felt. I was amazed that no other man had taken her as mate since the passing of her Marquise. 
As my memories flooded her mind, she gazed into my eyes and released her fangs from my arm. Her blood-stained lips were quivering, and her hands trembled. So many battles. So much strength. You fight as if Geneve the Conqueror herself blessed you. You are amazing, as is your sweet goddess-like blood. I want more, she said. Her eyes were like beautiful red crystals, as she continued to stare at me with bloodlust. Her whole demeanor had changed the instant part of me had entered her. Now do you understand? After the wound healed, I wiped the blood from my arm with the crop top lying on the bed. With her thumb, she removed the droplets of blood from the sides of her mouth, never breaking eye contact with me. Not once have I seen anyone do something so honorable. Those who are part of the first wave in planetary conquest suffer the highest casualties. You've doomed yourself to save others, she said. I smiled and tossed the shirt back onto the bed. It's funny, because Shade said the same thing. When can I have more? She began to caress my shoulder softly. I raised a brow as my puzzled glance pierced her lustful eyes. More? I asked, hoping she wouldn't say what I thought she would. More of you. Your blood is rich with knowledge and sweet like the nectar of Galleon blood wine. I need more of it. Her fangs grew longer. I exhaled slowly and turned my body to face her. I'll tell you what. Put this whole teaching me etiquette plan out of your mind and find out where the Empress took Joseph, and I'll give you all of me. And when I say all, I grabbed her wrist with both hands and pulled her against my body. I mean all, I said in an alluring tone. It seemed as if the power of seduction would work in my favor after all. Promise? She wrapped her arms around my shoulders. I had to clear my mind of all deception and be completely truthful. The mind-thought connection had been established the moment she tasted my blood. In any event, I wasn't planning to mislead her. The Marchioness seemed innocent and loyal enough for the most part. I caressed the small of her back and grinned. You have my word, I assured her. She drew closer, so close that our noses almost touched. After everything I saw in your blood, teaching you etiquette is the last thing on my mind. It seems as if no one has any etiquette anyway, she joked. I breathed in the smell of her skin, and it was like a wave of chaotic bliss. Her soft, plush lips touched the side of my neck, and we hugged each other tightly. I soon found myself contemplating the sweetness of her blood and how it might taste on my tongue. The lust influence within her was clouding my thoughts. I had to focus on getting Joseph back, so he could tell me whatever secrets he'd been keeping. Another taste? She asked. I felt the tips of her fangs graze the skin on my neck, so I pushed her away and ran my hand through her glowing dark hair. In time, right now, we have to get to the council, I reminded her. She nodded. Of course, princess. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to experience a piece of you. I've never tasted a warrior's blood. And it won't be your last time as long as you remain my ally, I said. She looped her arm in mine. Allies we will be, she assured me. We proceeded out the door and down the hallway. Your blood memories have revealed the truth to me. Now that I've seen what the Empress is like, my choice is made. Thank you, Elisa. I knew that I could trust you. We approached the council room entrance and parted ways. My only hope was that Joseph was all right. My mind didn't need to be muddled when I led our forces into battle. The doors to the hall swung open before me. I took a deep breath and entered the room. It was amazing. The interior sparkled with radiance. The walls and floors were made of smooth red and black crystal like stone. There were three rows of five seats behind the Emperor's royal chair, each higher than the one in front of it. Portions of the seats were made of crystal and twinkled under the red light that beamed across the room. I'd have to explore the palace in more detail later. The Emperor sat in his royal chair and gazed right at me. He was wearing a clean crimson silk suit, which was mostly covered by the golden cape that hugged his shoulders. Shade approached me from the corner of the room and bowed to one knee before taking a seat in the first row behind the Emperor. My auntie was nowhere to be found, and I could only assume she was with Joseph. I had to get out of here, and quick. Elisa entered the council hall from a side door and took the lone seat in the center of the room. She looked to the Emperor, who nodded at her, which I assumed was the signal to begin. 
I stood in the center of the room and waited for the proceedings to start. This whole thing was ridiculous in my mind, but rules were rules. I hoped this wouldn't take long. Attention at council, said Elisa. Now marks the beginnings of the proceedings. Imperial Princess Athanasia Sonia of Vampiria, you stand accused of using your gifts in a threatening and dangerous manner against one of your peers. You will now face judgment. I tried not to appear annoyed, and allowed all five members of the council to speak. Most of them I didn't recognize, but it didn't matter to me. Joseph and the secret he held were the only things that occupied my thoughts. I zoned out and allowed them to speak. None of it mattered to me anyway. The plan. I can't believe this! You planned this, didn't you? I shouted at Shade, who'd followed me into the feeding hall. I was beyond pissed. Their judgment was bullshit. I had no say in what they were going to do, Athanasia. I tried to get them to stop the judgment altogether, he said. I growled and slapped his hand away when he tried to touch me. All of it. My request for revenge. My chance at glory in battle. Every single one of my goals would be ripped from me in a matter of hours. I wouldn't stand by and let that happen. I refuse to. Listen to me. I'm sorry for what happened. However, I think it's better this way. My goal is to love you and keep you safe. You staying here at the palace while I lead the charge on Gala is what's best for both of us, said Shade. My fangs and claws grew as rage built in my gut. My hair and body began to glow at the very thought of being left behind during the conquest of Gala. This is what you wanted all along, isn't it? To prove yourself in battle and become my mate? You've stolen my glory from me, I bellowed. Hey, you're the one who decided to go all Genevieve the Conqueror and blast the shit out of me for just getting a little jealous, he said. A little jealous? You were going to start another battle with Joseph when you saw us together. I just wanted to talk to him before he left. And now, thanks to your temper and controlling behavior, I may have missed the chance for him to tell me something important. What the hell is wrong with you anyway? Why do you pursue me with such passion? I am the princess. What makes you think you have any say in whom I talk to or spend my time with? You just don't understand, do you? He turned his back to me. I grabbed his shoulder and spun him around so I could see his eyes. Understand what? The blood's passion. When a vampire falls in love, all logical thought vanishes. Chaotic emotions rule their blood. That's why you've been fighting me, isn't it? You feel it boiling within you, but you're trying to suppress it. Tell me the truth, he shouted. I don't know what you're talking about. I crossed my arms and shook my head. He came closer to me and pressed his lips to my ear. Now who's lying? He whispered before walking away. I closed my eyes and tried to keep from watching him leave. I was far too upset for love or any other emotion at the moment. The fact that the Emperor decreed that Shade would lead the charge on Gala still made me furious. That was probably what the Emperor had in mind all along. Somehow, I got the feeling that my uncle wanted Shade on the first wave and my judgment was just the opportunity he needed to ensure that it happened. Increasingly, I was beginning to see just how disreputable the actions of my auntie were. The Empress continued to meddle in my affairs. That, coupled with the archaic rules of this court, had me thinking of the Duke's offer. Perhaps my uncle was too antiquated to rule further. Maybe it was time for someone new to claim the throne. Someone with a vision for the future. As it stood now, and with the way things were progressing, I'd be nothing more than a puppet for display at court. That wasn't going to happen if I could help it. I'd rather die than live such a life. My princess, said Elisa. She approached me from behind with a bottle of Galleon blood wine. I'm sorry for what happened. I know how much leading our forces to Gala meant to you. Here, take this. With her delicate hands, she gave me a red cup made of crystal from the caves of Oswago, and poured the blood wine up to the brim. I was thankful for it. I needed something to calm my nerves after that blasphemous judgment and Shade's emotions. Thank you, Elisa. I drank the wine swiftly and wiped my mouth with my thumb. The feeding hall was empty, 
which was why I'd come here directly after the Council's judgment. I couldn't help but notice the little smirk on the Emperor's face when he dismissed me. That only confirmed what I'd always thought. The Emperor was up to something. Hell, they were all up to something. Like every other room in the palace, the feeding hall consisted of luxurious stone and glass walls, mostly black mixed with gold coloring. I took the bottle from Elisa and sat in the saloon area with my glass. I intended to drink the entire bottle by myself and then pass out in my room. The magnitude of my situation was slowly dawning on me. I'd never get the opportunity to avenge my father on the battlefield, and Gala would fall at the hands of some other warrior. Shade would most likely perish in battle, and Joseph would be gone from me. I'd be left alone to wander the halls of this palace with no glory, no mission, and no real purpose. It'd be an insult to my legacy if I let that happen. If it weren't for me, our empire never would have conquered the planet Sandiel. If it weren't for me, dozens of worlds within the last 50 years wouldn't have known the power of the vampire. No, Gala would be mine to triumph over. And I didn't give a damn what the Emperor had to say about it. I'd find a way. I had to. Are you alright, Princess? asked Elisa. She sat next to me and called for another bottle. I took another swig of the wine. Please, call me Athanasia. Formalities are superfluous at this point. As you wish. She rubbed my back and took the bottle from me. By the way, I found Joseph. He's with the Empress in her quarters. The doors are locked, and two armed guards are standing post. I wasn't able to see much, but I heard the Empress and Joseph screaming at each other through the door, she said. I stared at her and breathed a sigh of relief. If they were yelling at one another, then he was still alive. Do you think you can do me a favor? I asked. Elisa took a swig from the bottle as well. What do you need? I think my former guardian's life is in danger. Would you mind distracting the guards long enough so I can get into the Empress's room? She took another swig. How would I be able to do that? I gazed at her beautiful athletic body and stunning facial features and smiled. With your attractive body, full lips and wanting eyes, I'm sure you'll find a way. She gasped. Surely you don't propose that I... I'm the Marchioness of Azwago. I can't be seen fraternizing with low-level guards. You don't have to be intimate with them. Just distract them long enough to get them away from the door, I said. She lowered her gaze and handed me the bottle. I don't know, Athanasia. I've never done anything like that before. The barmaid, with her beautiful, fluffy dark violet hair and pink eyes, approached us from behind the bar and handed us each a shot of blacklight platinum the most potent form of liquor ever made. One shot would have any vampire intoxicated for a full 31 hours. It was derived from the fermented sweet blackberries of Karathra, mixed with ancient Therian blood. It was not only the most potent form of alcohol, but also the rarest. Compliments from those two gentlemen across the way, said the barmaid. We looked over our shoulders and saw two young nobles who'd just entered the feeding hall sit at a table a few feet away. They were smiling, and their eyes were affixed on Elisa and me. They had to have known what these shots would do to us. Perhaps that was their intention. Easy prey. I'd been told Blacklight Platinum was meant for only the highest of nobles in royalty. Those young nobles must have known who we were. Otherwise, the barmaid probably would have turned down their request to serve us these shots. It did, however, give me an idea. What is this? asked Elisa. With her middle and index finger, she picked up the shot glass and waved it under her nose. Wow, it smells sweet and peppery. I grabbed her wrist. Don't drink it. It's a thousand times stronger than blood wine. She placed the glass back on the table with a curious look in her eyes. I nodded to the barmaid. Thank you. But please tell those two young men that we'll be taking these drinks to go. I grabbed one of Elisa's hands. This is what's going to happen. I cupped my other hand over Elisa's ear and whispered so the barmaid couldn't hear what I told her. These shots were going to be consumed, but not by either of us. After I revealed my plan, Elisa flinched and stared at me, flabbergasted. For the love of gods, I, I can't do that, she exclaimed. Would you keep your voice down, please? Joseph's life is at stake. Do this one thing for me and I'll do anything you ask, I pleaded. Her hair overlapped the right side of her face, 
and she gazed at the shot glasses. I knew she had reservations about my request, and her doubts told me one thing, that the ways of the vampire probably didn't expand as far throughout the Empire as I'd been led to believe. All right, Athanasia. Let's get this over with, she said. I smiled, scooped the shots off the table, and handed them back to her. The reluctance I saw in her eyes would soon pass once I'd gotten Joseph to safety. The Empress's expression and less formal liberty were like a warning in my gut. She would do to Joseph what she'd done to that bather. That I was sure of. And I couldn't let him die like that. Lost Knowledge Elisa approached the Empress's chambers and saw the guards were posted with their weapons. We could hear the commotion coming from within the room. Something in me was urging me to get in there. Fast. The Marchioness, per my instructions, had changed into a pink silk nightgown that exposed her voluptuous firm cleavage and was so fair that the white lace satin thong she wore was quite visible. The guards broke their bearings and stared at her in amazement with each step she took. Holding a shot glass in each hand, Elisa gave them an alluring gaze and winked for them to join her. Within seconds, the guards set their UV guns by the door and fast stepped toward her as if she were a meal. She sat on a red velvet couch a few feet away from the Empress's door, leaned back and crossed her legs. Elisa was a natural, and because of her, my plan was working perfectly. Marchioness of Eswago, wh what are you doing here? Asked the larger guard, whose eyes were glued to Elisa's breasts. I could ask you the same thing. She uncrossed her legs and raised them high enough to where both men could see the full layer of her thong that covered her womanly lips. I've brought you a present. Delicately, she handed them each a shot glass of black light platinum. What is this? One of them asked. Elise caressed the more massive guard's head and giggled. A prerequisite, she whispered. For what, my lady? She opened her legs and caressed her breast slowly as they watched in sexual desperation. They were shaking and stuttering their words. Elisa's effect on them was striking. For the both of you to have me right here, right now, on this very couch, she said. Are you serious? This isn't some kind of joke, is it? Asked the smaller guard. I am without a mate, which means I'm free to do as I please. If you don't want me, then I'll find someone more confident in their prowess to pursue what's laid before them. The guards looked at each other. No, wait, we're game, said the larger guard. They smelled the liquid within the glasses and gulped it down without thinking. Perfect. Have a nice rest, said Elisa with a smile. What, what do you... said the smaller guard as his eyes glazed over. He sat back on the couch, shivering. It didn't take long for the other guard to follow suit. They weren't of royal blood and their systems wouldn't be able to withstand the effects of blacklight. Intoxication was instant. The guards slurred and drooled all over themselves before passing out. Elisa jumped off the couch and ran toward me. I can't believe I just did that! Was it fun? I asked. Not to the extent that I would ever do it again, she complained. I smirked and patted her on the back when we heard a loud crash come from within my auntie's room. Her screams were evident, as was Joseph's shrieking. I ran to the door and used my gifts to freeze the door lock before kicking the door wide open. In the middle of the floor they lay, fighting. Both of them had their fangs and claws extended. The Empress was fully nude on top of Joseph, who was shirtless. To die between the legs of your Empress is the only honor you'll ever receive, vagabond! shouted the Empress as they continued to wrestle. Elisa stood there shocked while I leaped to Joseph's aid. Get the hell off him! I screamed. The Empress laughed when I tackled her and dragged her off. Joseph lay there exhausted, with claw scratches all over his body. Did you not learn your lesson during your first judgment? Warned the Empress. I'm not using my gifts on you, so I'm free and clear. I threw her onto the bed and tossed the sheets over her body. She hissed. That vagabond belongs to me now. How dare you interfere in my affairs? Her eyes were red with blood's passion and a deviant lust. He belongs to no one, and when it comes to Joseph, those affairs become mine. I will do as the Emperor ordered and return him to Yaxtaya at once. He's not going to fall victim like so many others you've let lie in your bed. 
I was stern in my tone and fierce. I never thought I'd speak to my auntie that way, but her bloodlust was out of control. Are you all right? Elisa asked him. He breathed heavily before staggering to his feet. Ha! Huh. I know why you want to save him, Athanasia, but you're too late. The Empress wrapped her body in the sheets and sat at the foot of her bed, eyeballing Joseph with a sadistic grin. What are you talking about? I turned my glance to Joseph and noticed the expression on his face. It was one of a drone with no thoughts or memories in his mind. His eyes were void and gray. What the hell did you do to him? I shouted. We simply ensured our secrets would be kept. There's no reason for him to retain information regarding royals and intergalactic affairs, now that he's a vagabond. You erased his mind? I bellowed. Of course not. We just took away the pieces that had to do with sensitive information. After what happened earlier between the three of us, we couldn't be certain that Joseph would keep classified information to himself. Resentment for becoming a vagabond may have someday led him to tell our enemies our weaknesses. The Imperial Intergalactic Council ordered this, and the Emperor agreed. So you can take your death glare elsewhere. I didn't act alone in this, she professed. Thank you for saving me, Athanasia. That succubus doesn't take no for an answer. His wounds began to heal. What can you remember? Tell me. He hung his head low and sighed exhaustedly. <sighs> I'm sorry, my lady. I failed you far too many times to be worthy of you. I understand now that if it weren't for my jealousy, none of this would have ever happened. All of it's my fault. I lifted his head back up and stared into his eyes. That's not important right now. Do you remember what you were going to tell me earlier? You said something about telling me the truth. Do you remember what you were referring to? He shook his head, and the Empress started laughing, as if she were victorious in some devious game. I'm sorry, but there's a gap in my memory. I don't even remember saying anything like that to you, he said woefully. My blood boiled, and my fangs grew as I charged at my auntie. Before I could leap onto the bed after her, Elisa stood in my path and pushed me back. Don't, my princess. You mustn't, she said. The whole time the Empress sat on the bed, laughing under her breath. I wanted to sink my fangs into her neck so badly that I could almost taste it. Calm down, princess. I'm sure whatever he had to tell you was nothing of much importance, said the Empress. If it wasn't important, then why'd you erase it from his memory? I shot back. It's none of your concern. You are within my domain. I'm your overseer, Princess Athanasia. Don't you forget that. She stood from the bed and bumped into my shoulder purposely before walking out. If you erased his memory, then why were you trying to kill him? I asked. She sneered and continued to walk without fully acknowledging my question. Not everything is about you. Maybe I just wanted to satisfy my urges, she said. It took every ounce of willpower I had to keep me from jumping on her back and drinking from her neck. Whatever Joseph had to tell me was lost now. The Empress knew something about it, and I couldn't understand why I hadn't seen it in her blood memories when I fed on her. She must have masked it from me somehow. Damn her. Oh, and by the way, Princess, the attack on Gala is happening tonight. The original plan is moving forward since you'll no longer be a part of it. She winked at me and went into her closet. I swear the bitch was asking for it. Tonight? You're attacking Gala tonight? Asked a stunned Elisa. That was what the Emperor had planned from the beginning. Tonight, Gala will fall, and Shade will lead the victory in the first wave. I clenched my fist and was grateful that I didn't have the dagger in my hand just then. The Duke was right after all. Everyone had their own agendas, and I was playing right into the court's demands of me. It seemed as if I was becoming a damn puppet. The one thing I'd feared the most. If I were you, I'd find Shade and say my goodbyes. Tonight is probably the last time you'll ever see him again. After all of your years of training, battle, and killing, you should know the first wave is fodder, said the Empress. Elisa stared at me with worry. It pissed me off beyond anything that, despite all of her bullshit, the Empress was right. I had to find a way to stop Shade from going, as soon as possible. As much as I was upset over the whole situation and that damn judgment, I didn't want to lose Shade. I still needed to question him and his uncle. With the way things were panning out, the desire to rule grew within me. I saw it now. Either rule or be ruled. 
and Athanasius Sonia wouldn't be ruled by anyone, not even by my own blood. Elisa, please be sure that Joseph feeds and is escorted back to Yaxtaya. His time in the palace has ended, I requested of her. She bowed and took Joseph by the arm. The Emperor is planning a pre-victory celebration ball before our forces invade Gala. We expect you to be there, said the Empress. I turned my back to her and walked out of the room, following Joseph and Elisa. Sure, I'll be there, I lied. I had no intention of going to some ball. My place was in battle, and that was where I would be, no matter the cost. To hell with this court and its politics. My Deception I donned my tactical armor and headed to the interplanetary flight dock. The feel of my armor was something I'd missed. It was the highest grade of nanotechnology that felt like a second skin as it hugged my body from neck to foot. It also adapted to my gifts, moods, and muscles, as well as enhanced them. With my UV sword on my hip and a dagger strapped to my ankle, I was ready for battle. I would need my weapons if my plan was going to work. Before my transition to Princess, I'd been the Imperial Commander of the Necropolia Ground and Space Forces, the first line of defense within the Triworld Collective. After the Royal Challenge, I thought that would be the last I'd ever see my uniform. However, battles still called me. It hadn't been a week since I was last in combat, but thanks to the Empress's manipulation and my uncle's declaration, I'd soon see myself once again in the heart of war. This would be the only way I could avenge my father's death and I would not allow my uncle, the council, or anyone else to take it away from me. Princess Athanasia, said three soldiers who bowed as I approached them. I put on a stern expression and stared at them with my glowing red eyes. Is my ship ready? I barked. They stared at each other, confused. Your ship, princess? Asked the older soldier in the middle. Yes, my ship. The invasion will begin in less than an hour. Where is my ship? I shouted through growls. They rose to their feet, yet kept their eyes lowered. My princess, we never received an order to have your ship ready. We were ordered to prep Shade of Sandiel's ship due to him leading the forces into battle, he said. Shade is no longer leading the assault. I am. But my princess, no orders were- These are your orders. I grabbed the hilt of my UV sword and stared at them threateningly. Get my ship ready now, or die by my hand, here and now. The choice is yours. The three of them dropped one knee again. Of course, my princess. But your ship was retired when you transitioned to the court. It would take hours to get your ship battle ready, he said. I snickered. Fine. I'll take Shade's ship. Inform the lieutenants that we launch in the next 15 minutes. But the Emperor decreed the launch wouldn't happen until the Crescent Moon shines its rays on Vampiria, which is an hour from now, said the soldier to the far left. I shot him a death gaze and hissed. You know me. We've done battle many times, and conquered worlds together. And do you think I would deceive you? Give the order. I pushed them aside and ascended into Shade's ship. The soldiers looked confused, but obeyed my orders nonetheless. Having fought alongside me, they knew me well enough, and each soldier at my command would follow me through the chaos dimension if need be. As I'd said before, no one would stop me from my goal. Gala would fall by my hand. I boarded Shade's ship, sat in the command chair, and placed a tiny microchip on my temple. This would allow me to control the ship with mind thought alone. The sooner I was off-world, the better. No one, be they the Emperor, Shade, or anyone else would be able to stop me once the invasion force and I were in orbit. The Emperor would have no choice but to allow me to continue. With my mind fully synced into the ship's mainframe, I ascended into the air. All the pilots and soldiers scrambled below me, as I made the ship's hull transparent so I could see what was happening when I took flight. All space and airships within the Empire were equipped with the same nanotech as my armor. It changed and adapted to our will, which served us well in combat. My dream was finally becoming a reality, and soon, my father could rest knowing he was avenged. Attention to all those of the Triworld Collective, colonies, outer planets, and the like. An important mandatory message from the Emperor will be broadcast momentarily, said the artificial intelligence hologram each ship was furnished with. I engaged the anti-gravity engines and broke past Vampiria's atmosphere. 
The crescent moon reflected the rays of the red sun. The view was so much more beautiful from space. Over 100 ships followed as we hovered in orbit. I couldn't believe my uncle would only allow 100 ships to lead the first wave of attacks. This was going to be a slaughter if I didn't figure out a way to avoid a head-on assault. With a planet as fortified as Gala, attacking directly would mean sudden death. The reason I'd asked for an extra day before the attack was so I could create a battle strategy that didn't involve mass suicide. However, that advantage had been taken from me the moment my uncle decided to launch the attack today. I'd need to think of something, and soon. Incoming message, high priority, said the AI hologram. They'd probably figured out my deception and were now planning to call me back. But it was too late. I was already off world and there was no turning back. I activated the hologram image display. It appeared the message was going out live because the room from the image was full of high-ranking royals. I zoomed out and realized they were in the Crimson Council Hall, the same room where my judgment had taken place. There stood the Emperor with a UV dagger in his hand. Bound in chains, the Duke of Sandiel was kneeling in the center of the floor, bruised and beaten. What the hell was happening? Duke Adari Muscaya of Sandiel, you stand guilty of treason against your Emperor and the Crimson Asa Court. The sentence is death, shouted the Emperor. The Duchess of Sandiel approached her bloodied mate with contempt in her eyes. I never thought I'd see something like this. Had she betrayed her own mate? Tell the Empire why you conspired to overthrow the Emperor, and who you'd think was worthy enough to take his place. The Duchess commanded. The Duke spat blood at her feet and laughed. It was the night he took you into his bed, wasn't it? Was that the night you decided to betray me? Was it, you bitch? Answer the question, traitor, said the Empress. The Duke continued to laugh and tug at his chains. Why should I tell you anything? The Emperor is a relic in the face of our discoveries. If he can't see the truth, then he is unworthy to rule. And what truth is that? hissed the Emperor. That there's more than one universe. There is a multiverse. You and your laws are keeping the vampire race stagnant. If you truly want the bloodlines of the vampire to conquer all, then you must listen to your scientists, shouted the Duke. The Emperor scoffed and sat in his chair. The multiverse theory is no more tangible than your attempts to dethrone me. You do believe that I am not all-knowing. Did you think that your subterfuge would go unnoticed? The Duke shook his head and hissed. If you were all-knowing, then you'd know that I'm right. You're a fool, he screamed. The Emperor activated his UV dagger and threw it directly at the Duke's head. The blade found its mark and instantly turned the Duke to ash upon contact. My mouth dropped and I sat there, shocked. I couldn't believe what I'd just witnessed. First, Joseph's mind had been erased, and now the Duchess betrayed her mate, resulting in the Duke's death. Everything that I'd hoped to gain from this court was now in shambles. The Emperor had outmaneuvered everyone plotting against him within a matter of days. When I returned, I'd have to be on my toes. Ally could become enemy in moments at court. Shade of Sandiel, said an unknown voice. The council hall went silent as the ashes from the Duke trickled to the floor. Two guards brought Shade before the council and forced him to kneel in his uncle's ashes. Shade. You stand accused of withholding knowledge of your uncle's actions from this court. Being willfully ignorant of this treason doesn't absolve you from judgment, said the Emperor. Yes, my lord, said Shade, with his gaze lowered. It is for this reason you will lead our forces into battle with the bare minimum of ships. We will let fate decide your future. If you survive, you may claim your title as the new Duke of Sandiel. Are we clear? The Emperor summoned the dagger back into his hand. Yes, my lord repeated Shade. Bring forth the princess. It is unlikely you will survive, Shade. Best to say your goodbyes while you have the chance, said the Empress. I sat back in my chair, utterly stunned. That explained everything. This was the reason the Duke had been gone from so many appearances at court. It was also the reason my uncle wanted Shade to lead our forces in the first wave. The puzzle had been completed, and I sat here, ruining their plans. Where is the princess? asked the Emperor. I took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. The shock on their faces when I transmitted from the ship was going to be daunting. Has anyone seen Princess Athanasia? The Duchess called out. Using my mind-thought connection, I willed my transmission to interlink with theirs. 
My image came up on screen for the whole empire to see. I'm here, I said into the holographic transmitter. Athanasia, what in the blue hell are you doing on that ship? Bellowed the emperor, taking my rightful place in battle. I saw it all. I had no idea this is what you were planning, uncle. Nevertheless, I've commanded Shade's ship and left orbit with our forces. I'm leading the strike against Gala. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Athanasia, no! You can't do this! Screamed Shade. It is already done, I said. You. Why would you? Does avenging your father mean that much to you? To disobey my orders and take our forces off-world without my consent? Asked the Emperor. You left me no other choice. This is my fight. I made an oath to my father. That Gala would fall by the hands of a Sanyo. I'm the youngest Sanyo warrior left, and I'll fulfill my promise to my father. The Emperor wiped his brow and sighed. If you aren't the most stubborn egotistical... <sighs> Fine. Lead the charge. If you survive, you and I will be having a long talk about your continued insubordination. He turned to Shade. I suppose your life is now in her hands. If she dies in battle, then so too will you die by execution. Did you hear that, Athanasia? His life is on your head now. Do not fail him. Do not fail me, said the Emperor. I stared into the holographic transmitter confidently. I never fail. The Emperor smirked and ended the transmission. Revenge is mine. This is suicide, shouted one of my lieutenants. The moment we'd emerged from the artificial wormhole, a barrage of planetary cannon fire from the planet Gala had rained down on us. Within minutes, five of my ships were disabled. Thousands of their warships surrounded us, opening fire on each axis. There was neither escape nor retreat. One after another, my ships and lieutenants exploded in the darkness of space. This wasn't a battle, it was a slaughter. This was planned. They'd known we were coming. Princess Athanasia, we must retreat! Screamed my last surviving lieutenant before his ship was annihilated. I looked out my viewing screen and saw nothing but chaos. In less than 15 minutes, nearly my entire fleet was gone. This wasn't random, or by chance. Someone warned them we were coming. With plasma blasts the size of an asteroid aimed at the remainder of my fleet, I had no choice but to give the order to scramble. Who within our empire would have betrayed us like this? It was apparent we were sent here to die. Was this Shade's true judgment? I couldn't believe my uncle would collaborate with our enemy to kill his own kind. I just couldn't. Gazing out of my view screen, I saw there was nothing left of my forces. I maneuvered and continued to evade their ships and firepower. Having never suffered a defeat of this magnitude, I tried to hold myself together. They continued to fire at my ship and disabled my communications and shields. It was only a matter of time before I met my end at the hands of the species responsible for my father's death. Whoever had warned them of our attack would pay with their life. That I promised. I flew my ship behind one of Gala's moons and hid for a moment. I had to find a way to activate the wormhole drive and return home before I was spotted. However, there was no escape. It was then I saw something devastating. A game changer to our entire race. Two ships accompanied by a third massive vessel flew down from the dark side of the moon. The vessel flashed UV light in all directions, as if the ship were a miniature white sun. I activated my stealth mode and closed all connections with the outside so no light would get in. Our race had gone to great lengths to ensure our enemies knew nothing of our weakness. Now, it seemed these Sumanians had discovered our most vital secret. And with it, they could kill us all. I flew onto the surface of the moon and dug my ship deep into the mantle, blasting my way in deeper until it could go no further. Most of my ship's systems were damaged because of it, but I had no other choice. As long as my wormhole drive was still active, I'd be able to escape. I was surrounded by rock, dirt, and iron, and I wasn't sure if I had enough power to blast a hole large enough for me to create a wormhole. This wouldn't be my end, not at the hands of this inferior species. Through the melted iron and rock, I heard their ships blast at the surface to get to me. They wouldn't stop until we were all destroyed. There was no way I'd be able to create a wormhole in time, and there wasn't enough space to do so. Damn my uncle for sending his people to slaughter. He would pay for this. They all would. I had to think fast. 
The vibrations and thunderous sounds of their weapons were getting closer. I was stuck with nowhere to go. If today was my day to die, then I'd take out as many of them as I could. The choice was made, and there was no alternative. I removed the microchip from my temple and hastily reprogrammed the wormhole drive to create an incursion within the anti-gravity propulsion when activated. I initiated the self-destruct so that the explosion would trigger the wormhole and anti-gravity reactions. It was my hope the explosion would create a singularity. The magnitude of it should destroy not only the Suminian ships, this moon and their planet, but also their entire solar system. If Gala couldn't be conquered, then its existence would be eradicated from the cosmos. This was my last hope at revenge. I started the countdown for self-destruct and sat back in my chair. If I would die, then every Sumanian in this galaxy would die with me. I closed my eyes as the blast from their ship penetrated the melted iron around my vessel and began pounding on my hull. Five seconds. Four seconds. Three. All was done. Revenge was mine. Rebirth. And when the entity realized he would not prevail against her, the Seraph touched the bosom of her heart, and she was wrenched, her body twisted, broken and undone. The Seraph asked, What is it that you truly seek? And the woman said through pained body and soul, To be blessed by the gods so that the vampire will rule the cosmos. The Seraph dug deeper into her bosom, paralyzing her from head to foot taking hold of her stagnant, cold heart. The Seraph could see the woman was in pain, agonizing, mind-numbing pain. And the Seraph asked, Is it everything you imagined it would be? To be touched by the gods? To be blessed such as this? For it is not you who is made in the image of the gods, it is they who are made in yours. Held still in a beam of magnificent light, the woman locked eyes with the god face to face, and she was delivered. She was blessed. The knowledge consumed her as death awaited in the corner of the void to claim her soul. It was then she realized the gravity of what had occurred, and the seraph dislodged his hand from her bosom as she floated in darkness. Coldness pricked the skin of her body. Beams of light that once emanated from the seraph had now dimmed. What is your name? asked the seraph. And the woman said, Athanasia Sanyo. The seraph lightly touched the center of the woman's head, igniting a light that flashed brighter than a white star. No longer is your name Athanasia Sanyo, said the seraph, for you are known as the vampire. You have overpowered mortals and gods alike. Who are you? asked the woman. Please tell me your name. For what purpose do you need to know my name? asked the seraph. Am I not here to bless you with knowledge? Am I not one of the gods you pray to? Then, the woman said, Why? Why bless me? The seraph darkened and almost disappeared before her eyes. Alone, she floated in the void as death drew near. Echoing among the darkness were voices, thousands of voices. Behind her spoke a familiar voice amid the many, and the seraph unleashed its voice, which cleared the chaos of thousands of individuals speaking as one. Tell me, what is it that you truly seek? Asked the Seraph a second time. But the woman was silenced, her mouth sealed from answering. The void became colder, and the Seraph's image was transparent, dark like a shadow. And the Seraph asked again, What do you seek? Her vocals were lost with no mouth, lips, or tongue to speak. Yet she heard the voice in her mind, the passage of divinity and transcendence. I seek power. Ultimate power, said the woman, without moving her lips. The seraph said, Why do you seek more power when you overpowered a god and have undone many in your universe alone? The woman breathed the cold metallic air into her lungs and said, Because I saw the creators face to face, and yet I still live. In an explosion of light, the seraph appeared above her, hovering, and he bathed her in radiant light only meant for the chosen. You must first seek that which is between nirvana and perdition. You must be born again. May this be your Renescore. And the Seraph vanished from space and time, leaving the vampire in the dark void. 
Death approached in a cloud of black smoke. It was there she saw it. Her purpose. Her rebirth. Universal duality. What is she? I heard a voice mumble, as if it were an echo in the wind. My vision was unclear and cloudy, and I had no idea where I was. This had to be the afterlife. I would take my place by Genevieve the Conqueror and serve the gods in their kingdom. Oh my god, she has fangs, a voice exclaimed. The sounds of people scattering filled my ears. I rubbed my eyes so I could focus on what was happening. I had wrestled with a god and seen its light when the entity overcame me. Or had that all just been a dream? I couldn't be sure. Back away from her. We don't know what she is or where she came from. She could be dangerous, a different voice warned. I retracted my fangs and continued to rub my eyes. Where am I? I asked. The moment I spoke, multiple people gasped all around me. She speaks, and it's in our language no less, a voice said in shock. My eyes were focused, and I gazed at my surroundings. My sense escaped me when I realized where I was. This was impossible. I should have died in the blast. Had the gods saved me from death? It was all so bizarre. I was on a ship that appeared so primitive that one would wonder how it was able to bear the pressures of space. Everything was so cluttered, and there wasn't any artificial gravity. Everyone on board, including me, was floating around aimlessly. Where the hell was I? I activated my armor's tactical procedure and took zero gravity combat stance. She's a hostile, taser, one of the beings said. They shot a metal string at me, but it bounced off my armor and hit one of their own. The being's entire body froze, and an electrical current flickered where the pin of the string had hit them. Whatever that firearm was, it seemed to have weaponized electricity. As I surveyed the area, I couldn't help but notice that these beings looked just like the Sumanians, but with subtle differences in their skin pigmentation. Their hair color varied greatly as well. I'd never seen this species before, and I was amazed they didn't know what I was. The vampire was known throughout the universe. Even primitive beings such as these should have at least heard stories about us. My eyes illuminated red, and my fangs grew. If you value your lives, you won't do that again, I threatened. All five of them backed away, which gave me the chance to turn on my armor's self-gravity mechanism. I laid my feet on the floor of the ship and walked toward them. They all stared at me in disbelief. What are you? asked the one female among the group. I removed my dagger and clenched it in my right hand. I'm Imperial Princess Athanasia Sanyo of Vampiria. Now, answer me this. Who are you people, and how did I get here? I looked around and saw outside the ship from a window close to what appeared to be their command center or flight deck. In a state of shock, I dropped my dagger to the floor and stared in stillness. Outside wasn't space, but matter. The ship was floating within an endless mass of blue and white fluid. There were no stars or planets in sight. The fact that we weren't being crushed under the pressure of this vast liquid mass astonished me. Not to mention the lack of gravity within the ship was a mystery in itself. I knelt and picked my dagger off the floor. What have you tell me right now? My breathing was rapid. What is this place? They flinched at the tone of my voice. The terror in their eyes didn't stop my aggressive demeanor though. I wanted answers, and I wanted them now. Please try and calm down, miss. We're not going to harm you, said the woman. I raised the dagger to eye level and hissed. I'm going to harm you if you don't tell me what the hell is going on. What in the hell is all that stuff outside? And where the hell am I? My tone was more belligerent than before. That's the spatial matter, said the woman. They all looked at each other confused. The entire known universe consists of spatial matter. Are you saying you've never seen it before? My hands began to shake, and I almost dropped my dagger. Was I in the chaos dimension? Did my life not consist of glory and battle that would warrant my ascension to my gods and Genevieve the Conqueror? This was insanity. How could a universe that consisted entirely of matter exist? Listen, we're just as shocked as you are. We were on an exploration mission to a coral planet not too far from here, when suddenly, 
a blinding light appeared in front of our ship. The next thing we knew, you were materialized out of nowhere near the flight deck. An orb of golden light surrounded you. Come here and look, said the woman, pointing out the window. The light's still there. Given everything else that's happened in the last few minutes, we assume you came from there. My fangs extended as I recalled the visions I'd had before awaking here. That was when it hit me. What the Duke of Sandiel had spoken of was true. When my ship exploded, it had to have created a singularity that sucked me into another universe. The multiverse theory was correct after all. And I was standing on its proof. I turned to them, my eyes glowing bright red. Take me back there, I demanded. Fear was plastered all over their faces. Our ship will be torn to shreds if we get any closer to that thing, warned the smallest of the bunch. I allowed my fangs to grow to full length and advanced towards the five of them. I wasn't asking, I hissed. Do you have a death wish or something? Asked the female. To die in the service of the Empire is the greatest glory. Now head toward the singularity, or I'll drink you one by one. They stood in place as my body began to glow red and black. I was losing my patience, and I had to get back to my universe as soon as I could. I had to know if I'd been successful in destroying Gala. Even if taking such a risk entering the singularity would mean my life. I had to try. Everyone get back, shouted the female. The five of them glided to the flight deck, and she pressed a button on the wall near their view screen. Within an instant, a door slammed shut in my face, cutting me off from them. Do it! Get that thing off the ship! shouted the smallest alien. They gazed at me one last time before a massive explosion detonated behind me. In a flash of light and fire, I was sucked off the ship into that spatial matter. Those bastard aliens. They would pay for this. I had to think quickly. I had no idea what the spatial matter would do to my body. Using my gifts, I placed a force field around myself before the matter could completely consume me. As I floated through the substance, I neared the singularity. Soon, I was caught in its gravitational pull. There was no escaping it. Every atom in my body felt as if it were being warped. The pain was excruciating. I feared that I wouldn't survive this. Your choices have led to this moment. Have you learned nothing? Said a haunting voice. The same voice as before. Kind but fierce. What is it you seek? Said the voice. The pain paralyzed me to such an extent that I couldn't speak. And with this touch, be relieved of suffering. For it is the gods who grant you the will to speak, and existence itself, said the voice. I gasped and inhaled sharply. A massive hand made of gold appeared above me, glowing in pure radiance, and touched the center of my chest. All the spatial matter vanished in an eruption of fury with me at the epicenter, replaced with stars, planets, and nebulas. And just as quickly, the hand disappeared. It faded away into bright golden dust. Your universe is at its end, vampire, said the voice. My lungs filled with a divine air that made my soul tingle. Where am I? I asked. The beginning. Are you glad? How does it feel to be responsible for the decimation of an entire race? Said the voice. I looked around and realized I was, in fact, back where I'd begun. It was enthralling, just as much as it was daunting. The planet Gala and its moons were gone. All that remained was the singularity. I'd done it. Revenge was finally mine. The death of billions is on your head, vampire. So many innocents have fallen at the hands of your race. Yet here you are. The purpose of your existence is for me to show you a different path. You will become that of the Rule of Three. Together, we will create galaxies and worlds. But first, you must learn. The voice said. The singularity shrank until I could no longer see it. I was alone in the dark emptiness of space, floating aimlessly. Wherever that voice was coming from, I had to discover its purpose. Something was happening to me, and the owner of that voice had to be responsible. With no way to get back home, and no planets or vessels close by, I continued to drift. I had to make it back to Vampiria and tell the court that the multiverse did exist. They all probably thought I was dead. No matter. Once I made it back to court, I'd take pleasure in the sight of my uncle and his mate when they realized I'd succeeded where no other could. I'd destroyed Gala. My mission was complete. 
Such a short-sighted one-track mind, the voice said. Thunderous flashes of light engulfed the space around me, and benevolent forces instilled themselves in my soul. What the hell was happening? She isn't worthy, hissed a different voice, one much closer. Why her? Because I see in her what someone of your destructive nature never could. The balance between good and evil, said the first voice. And how did you come to this conclusion, Seraph? The moment we wrestled, that was her test. The benevolence in her is strong, despite her lust for glory in battle. She will serve in the creation of three. Seraph. That was it. I remembered it now. Like an echo in my mind, fighting to let loose from its cage. I saw it all just then. The knowledge came crashing into my brain, like a geomagnetic storm of a newly formed world. The first voice was that of a god, a seraph. A dark cloud formed above me in the same location the hand had been. No longer was I drifting. I was held still as the fog surrounded my body. Do you know me? Are you one of the faithful? Said the malevolent voice. Darkness consumed me, and my armor was stripped from my body as if it were nothing. I floated naked in the vastness of space. And the cloud expanded in perfect unison and dark green electrical charges shot in all directions. An emotion that I'd only felt once in my life, the day I was informed my father had passed, consumed all that I was. Fear. That was when I saw its face. An enormous serpent emerged from the darkness of the cloud and hissed at the sight of me. Do you know me, vampire? It asked a second time, with its tongue out, hissing. Its tone was devious, and its appearance scared me shitless. What? What are you? I asked hesitantly. Apep. I am Apep, the god of chaos. The counterbalance to a multiversal cluster that is yet to be created, it said. What do you want from me? I've come to examine a part of what will become the rule of three. I rotated my body forward and extended my hands in front of myself. Don't come any closer! I screamed. The beast laughed, with its asteroid-sized fangs advancing towards me. Or what? The smell of its breath was like a thousand rotting corpses. I'll blast you into the next universe, that's what. I threatened. Oh, by all means. Please, go ahead, it said. The fact that this monster was goading me made me a bit nervous. I closed my eyes and attempted to summon all of my gifts. However, a void lurked inside me that hadn't been there before. My gifts had been nullified. I was defenseless against whatever this beast had planned. This had to be the chaos dimension. There was no other explanation. To think, a wretched creature such as yourself will help in the creation of universes and worlds alike. Pity. We could have had fun together. The beast hissed before drawing back into the dark clouds. The enmity and terror I felt left with it. Everything that monster said wasn't lost on me, but I still couldn't bring myself to believe that such a creature could exist. Reality wasn't what it seemed. The smoke soon dissipated. The lightning stopped and stars were visible again. Of one thing I was certain. I never wanted to see that beast ever again. The day you learn, the day you grow, will be the day all the truths of reality will be revealed to you. Until then, I will watch from afar. Your universe's time will soon end. Just as others have within the multiverse, said the voice. I stared at the stars in the distance, perplexed. Where are you? Show yourself! I shouted in the limitless void of darkness. You can never see me. You will only see what your mind allows. Until you become my equal, you must dwell in a state of inquisitiveness. Only when you've seen, only when you know, Will you be able to comprehend the journey before you? What do you mean my universe is at its end? Stop speaking in riddles and give me a real answer! The signs of frustration in my voice were evident. You will know all that needs to be known when the time comes. From the destruction of your two parallel universes will come the birth of a ten-cluster mirror multiverse. This is the way the Omni has willed it to be. And so you must follow. Parallel universe? What does that mean? I asked, desperate for answers. Your cluster is composed of two universes. One of space, the other of spatial matter. These two universes have existed for over 51 billion years. 
The energy from your cluster's end will bring about the creation of multiple other universes. An explosion on a multiversal scale will generate ten parallel universes. The rule of three will govern these planes of existence. Lies! I screamed. The vibration of my voice echoed endlessly throughout space. What this entity was saying couldn't be true. The fate of my universe and the vampire was to perish. I couldn't believe it. There was just no way anyone could fathom such an ending of our all-powerful empire. Soon, you will see the truth. All things come to an end. You, however, will not, said the voice. What do you mean, I will not? What are you talking about? My fangs extended as I glided in circles to find the entity speaking. Just know, there will come a time when the fabric of your universe will rip to the last molecule, and everything you've ever known will be undone. And there, we will welcome the birth of the Seraph, the human, and the vampire. A flash of bright light materialized before me. It was almost blinding. All things exist on the word of the Omni. There is much you must learn before you take your place by my side. A golden figure stepped out of the light and flew toward me. I was frozen in place, unable to move or escape. And the Seraph touched the non-believer, paralyzing their body until knowledge soaked their soul, said the gold figure. Its bright gold hand reached for my bosom the same way it had in my dream. And with this touch, ah! I shouted as the entity placed its index finger between my breasts. You will be reborn. Visions of worlds, galaxies, and universes flashed before me. An entire complex of infinite universes and endless space emerged as I gazed upon them in awe. I could feel everything, sense everything. I was everywhere. How was this possible? What was I becoming? Allow this taste of knowledge to breathe into you, vampire. The malice in your blood must be purged before your journey can truly begin. Just remember the word. The Omni awaits you there. 100 years. I sat up with a piercing gasp and looked around. Sweat dripped from my shaking body, and I could still taste the metallic flavor of the atmosphere. Shooting to my feet, I gazed at the view in front of me. I couldn't believe it. I was home on Vampiraya, right outside the palace. The red sun graced my skin as the exhilaration of being alive brought me back to my knees. Had it all been a dream, or had that entity safely transported me back to my home world? I looked down at my bosom and saw a symbol that hadn't been there before. This symbol was in the same spot that golden entity had touched me. It was in the shape of wings with rays of shining light around it. My experience in space had to be real. I had survived the blast, been sucked into another universe, stared down a massive demonic serpent, and wrestled with a god. In my 200 years, I never experienced anything like that. And if my experience was real, then so was the entity's warning about the death of my universe. The joy of having survived couldn't overcome my depression at the prospect of such a fate for everything I'd ever known. The entity had to have been lying. Two universes couldn't just perish on their own. Maybe that entity would cause their destruction. If that were the case, then I'd have to find a way to stop that from happening. Athanasia? Princess Athanasia? Is that you? Shouted someone from the top of the palace steps. I can't believe you're alive. With their vampire speed, they ran down the steps and flew at me. I was still completely naked, so I crossed my arms over my chest before they could engage me. It was Elisa. Her hair had changed from black to light blue, but she was still just as I remembered her. My princess, how are you still alive? And how did you get back home? Everyone thought you died at the Battle of Gala, she said. I exhaled sharply. It's a long story. But first, I need to feed. Please, take me inside, I said. My body was weak, and it felt as if I hadn't fed in months. Yes, of course. Let me help you. Everyone's gathered in the arena for the royal challenge, she said. I stopped and stared at her in shock and disbelief. Royal challenge? What do you mean, royal challenge? I'm still the imperial princess. She looked at me with sympathetic eyes. My lady, you've been gone for over 100 years. My body shook even more furiously than before. What? I yelled. Yes, my lady. 
When you led the attack on Gala all those years ago, no one thought you'd survive. It was a suicide mission from the start. All of it was a test for Shade that you usurped for yourself. When the second wave got there, everything was gone. The planet, the moons, everything, including you and your forces. The Emperor decreed that you were successful, and history marked you as one of the greatest warriors the Empire has ever seen. Turn around and see for yourself, she said. I tried to keep my composure and slowly looked behind me. A massive statue of me in an iconic pose stood next to the monument of Genevieve the Conqueror. I dropped to my knees in awe. While I'd known they'd believed I had perished, I never thought that 100 years would have passed. The feasibility of such an event was hard for me to comprehend. I'd only been away for a few hours. I couldn't believe it. An entire century. Gone. My lady, if you don't mind me asking, where have you been? asked Elisa. I shied away and lowered my gaze. If I told her all that happened while I'd been out there, she'd probably think I'd lost my mind. And to be honest, I wouldn't blame her. Perhaps I was losing my mind. All that I'd seen within those few short hours was too much for me to take in. I needed time to process it. But first, I had to put a stop to this royal challenge. The Empire had to know I was alive. Well, maybe we can talk about that some other time. I can see you're distraught. Please, let me assist you to your room, she said. Garns, retrieve the servant woman to get your princess some clothes. Princess Athanasia Sanyo has returned. The four guards by the palace door gawked at me, before scrambling and running into the palace. I was thankful Elisa had been here when she was. I knew she didn't enjoy watching physical combat, and it would only make sense for her to be wandering outside the palace walls, while everyone else enjoyed the slaughter to come. In haste, three servant women came running toward us with a white robe, sandals, and a glass of blood. My fangs extended at the very scent of it. I was starving, and I needed replenishment. The moment they approached, I snatched the glass from them and gulped down the blood as swiftly as I could. It was beyond refreshing. The servant who'd been holding the glass joined the other two in dressing me. I had to gather my wits. For the Empire, 100 years had passed. There was no telling what had changed in all that time. What new worlds had been discovered and technological advances had been made. More importantly, the fate of Shade was always there in the back of my mind, even before the battle began. I'd been successful in my mission, so my uncle had to have let him live. That was if the Empire had any honor left after sending me on that suicide mission. The servants wrapped me in the robe, and I handed them back the empty glass. Stand back, I said. There was something I had to be sure of before I went into the palace. Elisa helped me back to my feet and stepped away after I was able to stand on my own. I created a ball of fire in my right hand and another one of ice in my left. The servants ogled in astonishment as I tossed the ice and fire into the air. I had my powers back. The nullification had only been temporary. That I was grateful for. We took the stairs up to the palace entrance. The guards opened the doors and bowed. I couldn't wait to see the look on my uncle's face when I walked into that arena. That battle had been a setup, and I intended to confront him about it. Someone had warned the forces of Gala we were coming, and I would get to the bottom of it, no matter the cost. After everything I'd been through, I was willing to take on anyone and anything, including the Emperor. The Return My room had been memorialized. I couldn't believe they'd kept my quarters up to royal standards for the entire hundred years. It was as if I'd never left. Everything, including my bed, remained the same, except for a few modern upgrades. After a quick stop to pick up some clothes, I headed right to the balcony doors to stop this challenge. The doors were now made of pure liquid crystal. They had the appearance of the red ocean when the sun reflected off it. I was still in awe of the technological advances that had been made during my absence. The doors, upon sensing my approach, parted in the center and allowed me to walk through. The announcer gasped when he saw me, as did everyone else when they heard my footsteps. All within my view turned to see who it was that had just entered the royal stands. Do you know who I am? I asked the announcer. Y yes he stuttered. Then announce my presence. Elisa followed behind me. My uncle was standing at the podium. 
He was about to declare the beginning of the royal challenge when the announcer interrupted him. Imperial Princess Athanasia Sanyo of Vampiria, he shouted into the amplifier. Everyone fell silent and turned their eyes to me. Jaws dropped, some fainted, and others sat shocked. My uncle waved his hand, and the central holographic projection centered on me, displaying my image across the watching empire. You, you're alive. You survived, he yelled out. I tried to keep my eyes and fangs in check as they all gawked at me. I looked down inside the arena. All the warriors had dropped their weapons and bowed. Hello, uncle. Are you surprised to see me? I asked mockingly. Despite my weary eyes, I was all but ready to attack him right then. Nevertheless, I had to restrain myself. I couldn't allow my fury to overcome my reason. How did you survive? Asked the empress. As I laid my gaze on her, I noticed something different inside me. A sense that I'd never felt before. It was almost as if I could feel thoughts. My emotional state was telling me it was my auntie who'd betrayed us. The look in her bright green eyes gave her away. There was no denying it. With my speed, I appeared in front of my uncle and moved him aside gently with my right hand. I had no time for formalities after everything I'd been through. Taking the podium, I inhaled sharply and released my breath soothingly into the amplifier. Hear me. All those who subjugate themselves before the might of the vampire race and the will of the empire. The royal challenge is hereby rendered void. Your princess has returned, I shouted. Not a word of protest was voiced. Every soul, common, noble, and royal alike, bowed in my submission at my proclamation. Whether I knew it or not, it seemed as if I was the most celebrated warrior of our time. Their respect was evidence of that. My uncle laid his hand on my shoulder and smiled at me. The glint in his eyes was telling. He was truly happy to see me. Emperor, Empress, I'd like to call a meeting of the court. It seems as if I've been gone for quite some time. I need to be educated on all the things I've missed, I said. The Emperor brushed the hair off my forehead and looped it behind my ear. I am amazed to see you standing here right now, Athanasia. There's much we need to discuss. The most searing question I have is where you've been all this time. However, my war-weary niece, you look like you could use a bath and some relaxation. Elisa, Ophelia, please escort her to the Pleasure Hall. Pleasure Hall? I shot him a confounded glare. I'll tell you on the way there, said Elisa, as she looped her arm in mine. I felt comfort in her soft skin the moment it rubbed up against me. Her personality hadn't changed at all. The Empress, with a bit of a smug look on her face, stood from her royal chair. Wait, I shouted, before she could come any closer. Forgive me, but I think Elisa and I will be fine on our own. The Empress and I locked eyes for a brief moment. Of course. Please show her the way, Duchess, said the Emperor. The Empress retook her seat and rolled her eyes. It was apparent she wasn't happy to see me. That didn't matter, however. She and I would have words soon enough. I focused my attention on Elisa, as I realized what title the Emperor had addressed her by. I placed my lips close to her ear. Duchess? You're a Duchess now? I whispered. She smiled. Much has changed in the last hundred years, Princess. I was honored with the care of your estate when you were thought to have perished. I was made Duchess of Oswago. However, I haven't departed from court in ninety years. The Emperor wanted me close by when you left, she said. I smirked and rubbed the soft brown skin of her forearm. Despite everything that had happened, I was glad to be home. Oh, I almost forgot. Elisa pulled me off the podium and back into the palace using her speed. I was a little weary from the lack of blood in my system. That one glass hadn't been nearly enough for me to regain my strength. We'll be making a detour before we head to the pleasure hall. There's someone I know you've wanted to see, she whispered. My eyes lit up when I realized to whom she was referring to. That could only mean one thing. Shade was alive. The Tower. We entered a gloomy space that screamed of death and depression. The Tower, where the vampires of nobility were sent to be punished for transgressions the court deemed worthy. This decrepit place was dark and smelled of rotting flesh. All modern technologies ceased to exist once we stepped through the doors of the stone-textured halls meant only for those who had disgraced the Empire. 
I lit the torches on the walls with my gifts. Elisa and I strolled through the tower halls as the screeching of tortured souls sounded in their captivity, from one room to the next. Vampires who hadn't fed in months were gnawing on their hands and arms, desperate for a single drop of blood on their tongues. If I had been deemed successful in my mission, then there should be no reason for Shade to be here. Right this way, princess, said Elisa. We took a left turn and saw a massive door right ahead. It was the entrance that led to the peak of the tower. Those who were sent there held the most dishonor of any vampire in the cosmos. Is Shade up there? I asked. Elisa looked at me, disheartened. I'm afraid so. Even though you accomplished your mission, the Emperor was outraged that you destroyed the planet and all its moons. His goal was to harvest Gala and its people. He took his anger out on Shade. The Emperor allowed him to live for fear of going back on his word. Your uncle told me that there was no suffering in death, and the longer Shade was alive, the more he could make him suffer. She sighed. You were right, Athanasia. All those years ago, you were right. The court is decadent, devious, and lustful. We pushed the doors open to the peak of the tower and journeyed up the stairs. The rotting smell faded, as did the screams. What words would come to his mind when he laid eyes on me? I'd taken his death sentence when I'd gone to Gala and embraced the possibility of destruction. I'd wrestled with the god and found truths I didn't quite know how to comprehend. What was hours for me was decades for him. I'd never seen myself caring for anyone. Keeping my desire for comfort and love restricted was what led me to be the warrior I was today. However, now that my goal of destroying Gala had been realized and the universal clock was coming to an end, I felt something push itself out of me. I didn't know if I was free to love, but as I drew near to the peak of the tower, my blood warmed and I succumbed to a sensation of affection. That entity must have done something to me. As far as I was concerned, love was a myth only the weak valued. Why was I feeling this way? He's right up here. Be mindful of his appearance. He's been in the tower for a long time, she said. We climbed to the last of the steps and opened the door to the small room where Shade was being kept. I gulped and entered the chamber, while Elisa stood back by the entrance. In a cruel display, Shade was chained to the corner of the walls, his clothes dirty and worn. His body was so frail that I was afraid I'd snap his bones with a simple caress of my hand. With his eyes closed and his head hanging, he sat slumped on the floor with no will to acknowledge my presence. Truthfully, he probably didn't even realize I was here. I caressed his chin and slowly lifted his head with my index finger. His skin was gray and lifeless. When was the last time he fed? I asked Elisa. She shook her head. I'm not sure. They're supposed to feed the banished once every five days, she said. I waved my hand at her. Come here. Using my thumb, I lifted his upper lip to get a more unobstructed view of his fangs. They were dull and gray, just like his skin. Why would my uncle do this to him? I extended my fangs and bit into my wrist. Wait, what are you doing? You're too weak to give blood, warned Elisa. Elisa knelt and moved me aside. I held his head back while she pricked her wrist and allowed her blood to drip into his mouth. By the way, why aren't there any guards in the tower? I asked. Blood continued to pour from her wrist onto Shade's tongue. He was beginning to drink. There isn't a need for guards. They keep the captives here so weak from the rationing of blood that they lack the will or strength to escape. Shade coughed and opened his eyes as Elisa's sweet, pure blood poured into his mouth and down his throat. He grabbed her arm and sank his fangs into it. The once gray skin that plagued his body began to return to its natural brownish bronze state. Elisa licked her lips and closed her eyes. The lust influence in Shade's bite was flowing through her veins. Gulp after gulp, Shade continued to drink. Sweat made its way out of Elisa's pores, and her body started to shake. I knew the feeling, and oh how I'd missed it. Rejuvenated. Shade released his fangs from her arm and exhaled huskily. Elisa stood back and gazed at Shade, with lust in her eyes. I, I, I've never felt anything like that, she said. I glanced at her before laying Shade flat on his back. Elisa's blood was making its way through his system, and he started to breathe normally. Why was his bite so pleasurable? She asked. He has lust influence in his blood. 
I know it's rare for a male to have such a gift, but he does nonetheless, I said. Right before our eyes, Shade began to change. His hair and skin brightened, his fangs protruded and glistened white, and his eyes illuminated red. For the most part, he was back to the way I remembered him. Sleek and beautiful. Where? Who, who are you? What's happened? Have you come to save me from the chaos dimension? He asked Elisa. He reached out to her as I stood by his side. Grateful he was alive. Turn your head, son of Sandiel. There's someone here to see you, Elisa said pacifyingly. I passed my hand over his brow, and he shifted his head to his right and saw me staring at him. A single tear rolled down from his left eye. There it was again, that feeling. The same emotion I'd suppressed for centuries. With each stare, each word, I felt as if I was falling deeper. I resented him for attacking Joseph and trying to steal my chance at revenge, but seeing him now, lying here helplessly with exhilarating delight in his eyes, made me feel something I thought I never would. What had the gods done to me? This can't be. What are you? A ghost or a spirit come to torment me further? I smiled and ran my hand through his hair. It's me, Shade. I'm here, I whispered. No, this is an illusion, just like the others. I longed for the day my love would return, but that day is now gone from me. I accept my fate. Let the demons have my soul. It means nothing without her. My Athanasia, he confessed. I climbed on top of him and breathed into his mouth. You remember this, don't you? The day you held me in your arms. The day you unleashed your wanting seed inside my body and I welcomed it. And the way we kissed in that everlasting moment when our tongues were locked and my saliva entered your sweet, sensuous mouth. Tell me you remember, I said. More tears fell from his face. I remember all of it, but you are not her. You're just a dream. My mind has played many tricks on me over the years. I will not allow it to happen again. Open your eyes and look at me. Claim me, and I will accept you. No longer will I stall or hide my feelings for you, Shade. I'm yours for the taking. It's true, son of Sandiel. We're not an illusion. Athanasia has returned to take you back to where you belong, said Elisa. With his frail hands, he reached for me and placed his fingers on my head. He grabbed and smelled my hair. I put the full weight of my body on top of him, lifted his torn shirt and pressed my breast against his bare skin. Before he could say another word, I kissed him between the eyes and swayed my body against his. Feel me, Shade. I'm real. I'm here. I said again. With his dirt-stained hands, he continued to weave his fingers through my hair, and I smiled. Can it be? My reasons fail me this day. As long as I survived in this wretched tower, my dreams are now reality. You're alive! He cried. As are you, I responded with a grin. How do I know this isn't a dream like so many others? I'm near death's door and I can't trust my mind to tell me the truth, he said. Well, I could blast you again the same way I did the last time we met, I said, smiling. He grinned as I climbed off him and pulled him to his feet. I didn't care what fate my uncle had for Shade. His penance was over as far as I was concerned. I broke his chains, hoisted him over my shoulder, and took him out of this cold, decaying place. Elisa followed, shutting the door as we made our exit. Shade needed a bath in blood much more so than I did, and he'd get just that. Do you want to take him to the pleasure hall with us? Asked Elisa. You read my mind without having to taste my blood, I joked. She laughed and summoned a communications module from a bracelet on her wrist. A holographic image of a bald blue male appeared, waiting for instructions. Please be sure a bath, blood wine, and bathers are ready by the time we arrive. By order of the Imperial Princess, she said into the device. Without any facial expressions or words, the holographic image nodded and the module disappeared. Would you like me to carry him? She asked. No, I'm fine. He isn't that heavy, being skin and bones after all. With no energy to protest, Shade grunted under his breath and held on to my waistline as we continued down the stairs. The feel of his arms around me gave me a warm feeling. Whatever was happening to me, 
I couldn't allow it to affect my reason. The Empress had much to answer for, and I would get the answers I sought. First, however, I had to attend to Shade, as well as find out the fate of Joseph. One hundred years as a vagabond would erode the self-worth of any vampire, especially one such as him. There was much to be done. The fate of my universe depended on me finding answers to that entity's warning. My universe wouldn't perish as long as there was still breath in my body. That I swore. Sex, sins, and enlightenment. Who conceived of this place? I set Shade down and allowed him to walk on his own. The hall contained three massive chambers. A hot room to steam, a warm room to scrub, and a cooler room to relax one's body. The walls and floors were made of hot, dark red crystal and stone. The steam room had raised circular platforms on which royals and nobles alike could lie to soak in the sweltering heat. The steam and warm rooms had small alcoves, with basins around the perimeter, where one could splash themselves with the soothing flavors of various blood wines. The ceiling displayed a large liquid crystal chandelier that lit up the entire hall with a dim red and white light. From one side of the hall to the other, there were bathers, male and female, all naked and waiting for orders to pleasure or bathe whomever called to them. This place was four times the size of my room, and the sense of blood and sex fumed from water to ceiling. Moans and screams of pleasure echoed throughout the hall, as vampires fed and fucked from dusk till dawn. The sight of it all made me thirsty. Nirvana, said Jade. Elisa laughed. No, it isn't. Not yet, anyway. She dropped her dress to the floor and removed her white lace thong. Her body was gorgeous. In the last hundred years, she hadn't changed at all. Still voluptuous and sensual. I noticed that she had her eyes on Shade when she continued to stare at him unwaveringly and licked her lips, fangs extended. Since he'd sunk his teeth into her arm and allowed her to experience the bloodless saliva that pulsed with his lust influence, I wasn't surprised. Elisa wanted more of it, as did I. But I couldn't allow her to have him. Shade was mine. My princess, said four male bathers bowing before me. Their cocks were long and thick, the hair on their chest subtle. Arousal crept its way inside of me, and my thirst for blood grew stronger. These men were high-class bathers of Varkia descent, straight from the Vampiria bloodline. I'd never seen vampires, I'd never seen vampires such as these serve as bathers or servants. This indeed was a special event. This had to be the Empress's doing. Come, Shade, said Elisa. She dropped to her knees and removed his pants. Two female bathers took off his shirt and began to scrub his muddied body. One of the male bathers approached Shade from behind and presented him with a full large glass of pure Galian blood. I was confused as to how the Empire still had access to Galian blood. I thought I'd destroyed the planet Gala and all the Sumanians on it. I'd have to inquire about that during the meeting at court. As the blood entered Shade's body, all that he was had returned. His skin, hair, and physique was replenished, just as I'd remembered him. Soap and water seeped down Shade's body, as the bathers scrubbed him thoroughly. He finished the drink and exhaled contentedly. We all noticed his strength returning. A male bather poured water over Shade's body, washing away the torment of filth he'd endured for who knows how long. The wet, muscled body of Shade and the bather were stimulating my need for blood and intimacy. This bather was well over six feet tall, with beautiful tattoos of black and red roses covering his chest and arms. Coupled with his well-pronounced fangs, pale white skin, long silky black hair and full beard, I had to hold myself back from taking both him and Shade right there. A female bather snuck up behind me and rubbed her hands across my shoulders. Her glistening blue hair, haunting green eyes, and porcelain white skin enhanced the sweet scent emanating from her pores. The lust influence within her was strong. If Nirvana existed, then this place would be its gateway. Shade of Sandiel, it seems the Emperor has granted you a reprieve, said the male bather who was scrubbing his abs and backside. No, my love saved me. She alone deserves your praise, Shade said. Two male bathers poured more water over his body, rinsing the rest of the dirt and grime from him. The soap they'd used smelled terrific, and it blended beautifully with the lust influence coming from Shade's pores. He was even more desirable to me than before. You may now enjoy the bath, my lord. 
You are cleansed, said the bearded bather. Elisa took Shade's hand. Come with me. The cool bathwater is scented with mint and crystalline flower petals to heighten the senses. It's been twenty years since I lay in its relaxing ambience, she said. I nodded to the bearded bather, suggesting he followed us. He didn't hesitate to comply. I haven't tasted a man since my mate died. You have no idea how much I need this. I knew you'd come back someday, my princess. I'm grateful for it, said Elisa. I gazed at her, baffled. You haven't been intimate with anyone since I left? One hundred years ago? I exclaimed. You promised yourself to me, Athanasia. So that you know. I went out there looking for you. I traveled the space where Gala used to be. I journeyed to other galaxies and planets, orbiting stars, and I found nothing. Nevertheless, something in me said you were still out there. Words cannot describe how elated I was to see you at the foot of the palace doors. I've needed you these last few decades. Shade needed you. We all did, she said, almost tearfully. I placed my hand on her soft, blushing face and rubbed her cheek with my thumb. You don't have to worry, Elisa. I'm here now. And I'll never leave your or Shade's side again, I promised them. She smiled and overlapped her hand on mine. If you do leave, I'll come with you, she said. As will I, Shade said. One of the female bathers began to remove my clothes, but I pushed her aside and presented myself before Shade. I wanted him to do the honors. It was the least I could do after stealing his mission to Gala. However, in retrospect, if I hadn't, he'd probably have died along with the rest of the fleet. I supposed it was for the best. I'd met my destiny there, and I was still trying to make sense of it. But that could wait. All that mattered to me now was feeling Shade's hands on my body. Resisting my feelings for him was no longer an option. I'd open myself to the possibility of love and desire. If what that entity said was true, then there was no telling just how long we had to embrace one another. Are you sure about this, Athanasia? What about the walls you've put up? What about all those barriers around your emotions that have kept me at bay for so long? Are you truly opening yourself up to me? Asked Shade. Whatever barriers I had, consider them crumbled. I'm not going to push you away ever again, I said. One hundred years ago, you told me love is for fools. What of... Shh. I pressed my index finger against his plush lips. That was the past. I'm here now, Shade. I give myself to you for however long we may have. I'm yours, I professed. I dropped my attire and removed my undergarments. The bearded bather and Shade both gazed at my body with a lustful fire in their eyes. Never in my 350 years did I think I'd have the opportunity to lay eyes on the naked flesh of Princess Athanasia, said the bearded bather. His voice was deep and manly. I couldn't imagine why someone of his prowess would be here serving as a bather. He'd be better suited on some distant battlefield, wielding a UV's sword or operating an armored spacecraft as a laser gunman. I stepped to him and placed his hand on the center of his heavily muscled chest. Tell me, what is your name? I asked him. He lowered his gaze slightly. Azura Red. My parents are a vampiria, but I was born on Zorrow. I spent most of my childhood traveling between Saro and Necropolia, he said. Slowly, I ran my hand down his chest until I graced his abs. You look more like a warrior than a bather. Would you mind telling me why you chose this path in life? He sighed. I was a warrior, my princess. I was the commander of the Elite Red Detachment. I gasped. Your Commander Red? Yes, my lady. Well, I was Commander Red. After the planet Gala was destroyed, the Empress convinced the Imperial High Command that our subcomponent of the Special Space Operations Group was no longer needed. When I protested, she made me a bather, he said. That's insanity! Your division was one of the best covert Special Operations Groups ever to exist, said Jade, seemingly upset. Forgive me, Princess, if I'm speaking out of turn, but I believe this is what the Empress wanted of me all along. For decades, I refused her advances. With the destruction of Gala, the Empress had the excuse she needed to disband my group. Now she has me right where she always wanted me. I've been at her disposal ever since that fated day the Imperial High Command recalled my unit. Nothing could be more disgraceful for a warrior than this, 
he confessed. During my time as Imperial Commander of the Necropolia, I'd heard stories of his unit and the feats they'd accomplished, but they were so covert I'd never had the opportunity to meet any of them in person. It was clear to me now. The Empress was playing my uncle like a game. All the events from the time of the Blood's Passion Ritual to my battle at Gala were her doing. Everything had been for the sake of her pleasure. When I met with the nobles at court, all of that would change. As you can see, Princess, the Empress has had free reign since you've been gone, said Elisa. With no Imperial Princess to aid the Emperor's decisions and rulings in conquest, the Empress has been given too much power and influence at court. That was the reason a royal challenge was declared. Many disagree with the way things are progressing, particularly with the disbandment of the Elite Red Detachment. Despite the destruction of our greatest adversary, we still need our most elite fighting force, just in case a new world poses significant resistance. All of that, however, was put to an end, just so the Empress could fuck Azura whenever she wanted. I wrapped my arm around Azura's waist and pressed his body against mine. He felt like bliss, and his scent was amazingly intoxicating. I promise you that you've spent your last day in the pleasure hall, I said. Thank you, Princess. As always, I live to serve the Empire, not the Empress, he said. I released him and took a few steps back when I realized what I was doing. His black aura was beginning to consume me, and his eyes lit up a dark blue whenever we touched. I knew what that meant. The last thing I wanted to do was cause Shade to go on a jealous rampage the same he'd done before. With temptation luring me, I turned away and caught a glimpse of Shade and Elisa. Their eyes were engaged with one another, and they were holding hands. I cleared my throat in a loud, annoying manner to get their attention. There's a private bath chamber right this way, my lady. I can guide you there, said Azora. Of course. I think it would be best if you joined us as well, I said. He nodded and smiled. I grabbed Shade and pulled him closer to me. As much as I loved Elisa, I couldn't let her have Shade. Azura would be better suited for her in my view. As we paced our way through the hall, we caught glimpses of various couples making love and feeding, while others bathed and engaged in conversation. It was a purifying sight. After all the war and destruction I'd seen in my lifetime, I'd finally let myself take in the pleasures of what the court had to offer. In going on that mission, I'd inadvertently become what I'd set out to be, the greatest warrior in vampire history. My monument had been constructed next to that of Genevieve the Conqueror. There was no denying my place among the greats. Now, it seemed I had another task. And that task as it stood right now was beyond my comprehension. This way, said Azora. He opened the doors to an enchanting chamber made of pure crystal from the lunar caves of the moon Sorrow. The room sparkled like the stars during twilight hours. A massive waterfall poured down on tainted water in the very rear of the room. Steam that smelled of swan berries and crystalline flowers emanated from all five pools of water scattered throughout the chamber. I felt my bloodlust deepen, and the desire to feed increased as it never had previously. Do you feel that? Our scientists were able to extract the lust influence from the blood of those who bear the gift and infuse it with the water in this room. This place is meant for the Emperor and is made alone. But I'm sure the Emperor wouldn't mind if we use it. This is a special occasion after all, said Azora. He winked at me before diving into the pool of water in the very center of the room. The flawless skin of his perfect round backside flexed when he jumped into the water. I didn't know what was coming over me, but something in my gut wanted to taste him just once, if not twice. Shade scooped me into his arms and carried me to the pool, where Azura was backstroking and waving for us to join him. Elisa followed behind and jumped into the water. Azora swam to her and wrapped his massive muscled arms around her curvaceous body. Despite being in the arms of that delicious warrior who had seen more battles than I had, Elisa was still stealing glances at Shade. Resisting the urge of lust influence from his bite would take someone of unimaginably strong will. And by the look of it, I didn't believe Elisa had that willpower. I feared she would want to lie with Shade eventually. Never in my life had I experienced jealousy, and seeing them gaze at one another didn't elicit those feelings in me at all. I suppose I'd allow the situation to play itself out and see where things led. Living in the moment was something I needed to learn to do. It seemed as if each passing moment, I was changing. Allowing another man to touch me wasn't like me. 
Falling in love wasn't like me. Where was the cold, calculating, battle-obsessed Athanasia that I used to be? The gods had done something to me in space to change my behavior. I was sure of it. We entered the water, and Shade gracefully released me from his arms. My senses were lifted to new heights, and my fangs grew to full length within seconds. I wanted Shade inside of me. I wanted both Shade and Azura inside of me, at the same time. Can we make it official, my princess? Asked Shade. I wrapped my arms and legs around his hard body and stared into his eyes. What is it that you want to make official? I asked. He moved his lips near my ear. Us, he whispered, before licking the left side of my neck. My claws grew, and I pressed them on his back. You would do me this privilege, my lady? I would be blessed to experience your soft, succulent body, Azura said to Elisa. I haven't done this in decades, Elisa said nervously. I swam over to them and put my hands on her shoulders. Shade followed and watched from behind me. I understand it's been over a hundred years for you, but for me, it was only a few days ago when Shade and I performed the ritual at court. I was nervous then, just like you are now. Just close your eyes and let it happen, Elisa. Embrace the ways of the vampire, I whispered. Azora smiled at me and pulled Elisa closer. I gazed down at the water, my mouth gaping at what I'd just said. Had those words just escaped my lips? What was coming over me? Azora kissed Elisa gently on the front of her chin and ran his fingers down through her wet blue hair. Now that we're purified, may I see you to the comfort room? He said. Will we do this? Asked Elisa. Only if it is your wish to do so, said Azora. He took Elisa's hand and climbed out of the pool. His skin was glowing white. Follow me, he requested. I nodded and took Shade's hand. As he exited the water, our skin glowed as well. I smelled and felt more cleansed than I ever had. The lust influence of the water was bringing me to my knees. I needed a man inside me, and I was sure Elisa could feel it as well. We followed Azora into the waterfall at the back of the room. The water splashed on us until we made it past the fall. In front of us was a set of doors made of black marble with a symbol of a V. There was no mistaking that this was my uncle's private pleasure room. After everything I'd been through, I didn't care how he felt about me using it. Today, this room belonged to us. I don't have the authority to enter this room, my lady. Only someone of the Sanyo bloodline can open this door, said Azora. I smirked. I can see now why you brought me here. He laughed and stood back so I could approach the doors. A configuration of a small woman appeared before us in liquid form, no longer than the palm of my hand. An artificial intelligence challenger served as a gateway for the room. I didn't understand why my uncle would have this place so heavily secured when its only purpose was for pleasure. Only the Sanyo line may enter. The Emperor and the Empress are the only vampires left who carry the bloodline to enter, it said. I lifted my thumb to my fangs and pricked myself in the center. A droplet of blood formed on my finger, and I allowed it to drop onto the head of the liquid woman. In an instant, the stain of my blood turned the challenger from water clear to blood red. Access granted, it said, before vanishing just as quickly as it had come. The doors opened on their own, and we were soon bathed in light. Black and red silk fabrics were draped on the walls and ceiling. Right above the massive bed in the center of the room, hung an enormous golden chandelier with lights made of crystal and liquid fire. The room was at least 20 degrees hotter than the rest of the chamber. We soon found ourselves sweating, with the need for blood and lust. Do you remember that day, Athanasia? Asked Elisa. I turned around and gave her my attention. Do you remember what you said? What did I say? I asked. You said that I could have all of you. You gave me your word. I nodded. Of course and I fully intend to keep it, I assured her. But does all of you include Shade? She asked. My jaw dropped. Excuse me? She wrapped her arm around Shade's waist and ran her fingers over his abs. I want to experience Shade. Please, princess, give me this one desire. One time and never again, she stated with lustful desperation. I looked at Shade and he stared back at me just as shocked as I was. Shade is my mate, Elisa, I said sternly. You two are not official mates, Athanasia. 
You have yet to answer the question he posed to you in the pool. You told me to embrace the ways of the vampire. Well, that's what I plan to do. As I stood there shaking my head in complete disbelief, Azora wrapped his arms around my waist from behind me. I could feel his thick, throbbing length press against my backside. The touch of it was ecstasy. I have desires for you, my princess. If you allow them to fulfill their desires on this day, we could fulfill ours. Think of it. The two most elite warriors in the Empire enjoying one night together. I can't think of anything more artful, more desirable, said Azora. But Shade, what of your jealousy? I was uncertain of what to do. You know I love you, Athanasia. I can sense something in you has changed, and by the way you're looking at me now, I know you love me too. We trust one another, and over the last hundred years, I've learned to control my emotions. Just being here with you is a treasure in itself. I know now the ways of the vampire. We are to separate love from pleasure, he said. Azura pressed his manhood more firmly against the crack of my backside, and my sense of myself was coming undone. I was dripping wet between my thighs, and the only thing that mattered to me in that moment was taking one of their long, thick lengths and pushing it deep into me. My bloodlust was calling, gaining all control over me, and I would likely submit to it. Let them have their fun, princess. All four of us are together now. There is no exclusivity this day, said Azora. With my fangs bare, I spun around and mounted Azora like an animalistic savage. We shoved our tongues into each other's mouths, and he carried me to the bed in the center of the room. I exhaled and moaned loudly when we flopped onto the bed. Laughter followed when Elisa and Shade joined us, kissing furiously. Elisa's naked backside rubbed against mine, and I caught a glimpse of her clawing Shade's back. Let's see who will come first, brother, Azura said to Shade. Brother? I exclaimed. But before I could question further, Azura buried his long, wet tongue inside of my pussy. Shade did the same to Elisa. The Duchess and I lay side by side, as our men fingered and licked between our thighs. With my mouth gaping, I took hold of Elisa's hand and squeezed it tightly. I was already on the verge of exploding on Azura's tongue. Oh, for the love of the gods, it's... it's been... it's been so long! Screamed Elisa as she came in Shade's mouth. He swallowed her juices and continued to rub her clit. Never in my life did I think I'd taste the woman I've admired all these years. You are everything I dreamed you would be, said Azora. I clasped my leg around his head and grabbed a handful of his hair, pushing his face deeper into me. His tongue was so hot, wet, and thick that I didn't ever want him to stop licking me. I closed my eyes and imagined both Shade and Azora inside of me at once. Thoughts of them taking this body to do what they wished with it filled my mind. And most of all, I wanted to taste Elisa. I'd succumbed to the vampire's lust in all its sensuality. The haze of allurement had me floating within the realm of passion, and I'd lost all sense of self. The warrior in me seemed to have faded, replaced with a force unknown to me. I was becoming something else. This feels so good, Athanasia. Thank you for allowing this to happen. I think it's time for you to let me take what you promised whispered Elisa. I felt her fangs grace my forearm as she plunged them into me. She suckled the blood from my veins, an act accompanied by the soft touch of her lips. The sensation of the lust influence in her saliva, coupled with the tongue of Azor on my clit, made me shiver with ecstasy. I wanted to come. I wanted to explode. Give me your blessing, and I'll endow the Duchess with everything I gave you that night you were mine, Shade requested of me. With my blood dripping down the side of her mouth, Elisa removed her fangs from my arm and gazed at me with a desperate pleading in her glowing pink eyes. I squeezed my eyes shut and dug my claws into Azura's hair as the strokes of his tongue became more aggressive. My inner thighs were shaking and I was oozing all over his lips and chin. Let him enter me, please, begged Elisa. I opened my eyes and saw Shade's throbbing length resting on Elisa's stomach right on top of her belly button. His balls were touching her dripping wet lips, and with my simple command, 
He'd do to her what he'd done to me on the night of the ritual. Azora shoved his index finger and middle fingers deep inside of me, which caused me to gasp. All logic was gone. Bloodlust had taken over me completely. Do it, Shade. I want to see you push your pulsating cock inside of her pussy. Promise me you won't stop until you bust deep inside of her. Elisa, don't let him pull out. Wrap your legs around him tightly, and hold him in if he tries to do otherwise, I requested. He smiled and caressed one of my breasts. As you wish, he whispered. With his left hand, he grabbed his cock and stroked Elisa's clit with the tip of his length. Elisa moaned and clutched my hand tighter when Shade slowly pushed himself inside, filling her dripping walls with every inch. Seeing the display drove me wild with passion. Azora sucked in my clit and fingered me faster, which forced me to climax in his mouth. A piercing scream escaped me, and my legs shook uncontrollably. The sound of Shade pounding Elisa's soft, fragile body made me hunger for more. Azura licked his fingers and bared his fangs to me with a smile. My turn, he said. I opened my legs wider until my knees hovered above my breasts. Azura laid his rough, hard, tattooed body on top of me and shoved his cock hastily in my pussy. I screamed at the size of his length. He sank his fangs into my left breast and rammed himself relentlessly in and out of my body. My inner thighs were still shaking from my climax, but he didn't care. He took what he wanted without request for permission. The air filled with intoxicating steam that refreshed my lungs, and the aromas of blood, sweat, and sex consumed the room from ceiling to floor. Yes! Yes! Fuck me! Shouted Elisa in a tone I'd never heard before. She hissed and screamed like a primitive vampiress on the hunt for blood. Shade plunged his fangs into her neck. She gasped as he held his manhood deep inside of her. Sweat dripped from both of their bodies. I'd never seen a sight so delicious. I was in awe. With my mouth wide, Azora stuck his middle and ring fingers inside and pressed down on my tongue. I gagged as he squeezed my left breast with his other hand and continued to pound my pussy with sublime strength. I was moments away from creaming all over his cock. The moans and hisses from Shade and Elisa only served to intensify the second climax in me that was ready to be unleashed. Azora slowly removed his strong fingers from my mouth and caressed downwards until his palm met my neck. He was going to do it. If he did, I would come within seconds. Tell me, princess, how does the warrior's thick cock feel throbbing inside you? He grabbed my neck and began to choke me. Just then, I came all over his cock and balls. The man knew everything I desired. It was almost as if he were reading my mind. My entire body shivered and flapped wildly on the bed. Azura held me down and choked me harder, all while pushing his length deeper and deeper inside me. My minutes-long climax passed, and I lay, motionless on the bed, gasping for air. Azura finally released his hand from around my neck. He laid his body on me and began sucking the nipple on my right breast. If I had my way, this would never end. The four of us would be here eternally, making love from the red sunrise until nightfall. I turned my glance over to Elisa. She was in the same condition as me, hot and exhausted, yet ready for more. My princess, only the gods know how badly I want to bury my seed deep inside of your wanting luscious body. But for now, I yield that right to your future mate, said Azora. Consider her promise to you fulfilled. Shade said to Elisa. She stared at him, breathing deeply, too drained to give a response. Azura pulled his pulsating length out of me and moved aside so Shade could take his place. <sighs> but I wanted to see you give all of yourself to Elisa. I shuddered, still feeling the effects of the afterglow from my orgasm. My seed belongs to you alone, my love, he stated in an imposing tone. I'll be gentle, Duchess. Just promise me that you will allow me to do what Shade couldn't, Azura said to Elisa. She smiled, flipped over onto her stomach, and arched her backside into the air. All debts are paid. Do what you wish to this body, she said. Azura took hold of her hips and pressed her backside against his manhood. Then so be it, 
I will give you my seed, and hope to the gods that it results in pregnancy, he said. Yes, please, give me what I want, an heir to my bloodline, she pleaded. Without another word, he thrust his length inside her. She moaned and planted her face into the pillows on the bed, giving herself over to Azura. Are you ready, my love? I've dreamed of this day for over a hundred years, Shade whispered. I caressed his cheek with the palm of my hand. Your wait is over. And to answer your question, yes, we'll make this official. I choose you as my mate. Mind, body, and blood. All of me is now yours. I open myself up to the possibility of love. With you and you alone, I said sincerely. With his luscious, soaked body on top of me, I wrapped my legs around him. The mixture of his sweet aroma and Elisa's sweat was almost too much for me to bear. I wanted, no, I needed to taste his skin, his blood. With his gentle touch, Shade stroked my face with the backs of his fingers and slowly entered me. I moaned at the sensation of him burying his length deeper into me. It was a feeling I'd longed for since the night of the ritual. Do you promise yourself to me for all time? Shade asked. The moment those words escaped his lips, I began to contemplate the warning of that entity I'd encountered in space. It was then I worried that Shade and I might not be allowed an eternity together if our universe was to end. Oh, don't stop! screamed Elisa as Azora rammed his length in and out of her with vampiric force. She was dripping down his cock. Shade and I couldn't help but stare. I wanted to see him explode inside of her. Perhaps the view of such delicious sensuality would get my mind off the entity's words. Shade ran his tongue over the side of my neck and whispered, For all time? I buried those thoughts away in the back of my mind, kissed his ear and then gazed into his eyes. Yes, for all time. Upon hearing my answer, he pushed himself deep inside me and cupped my backside with both hands. He squeezed me tight so that I could feel every inch of him pressing against my walls. I moaned and wrapped my arms around his head. I love you, Athanasia. Forever, I love you, he whispered. In all my years, I'd only shed a tear once. But now, with Shade making love to me softly, I wanted to let my tears flow. Was this what love felt like? Was this passion? If it was, then I wanted to feel it every day for as long as I lived. This was love. To give yourself over to someone entirely without reservation and without fear. My cold blood had become hot at this moment. It was then that I knew. I was in love with Shade. The gods have blessed me this day. Genevieve the Conqueror watches over me. The universe did not forget me. Today, I live said Shade. Tiny droplets of sweat from Elisa and Azora landed on my face, causing my fangs to grow in length. The scent of their sex was lavish. I stuck out my tongue and licked Shade from the bottom of his neck to his chin. His sweat tasted just as sweet as his blood. Will you take my seed, princess? Do you want all of me? His eyes were glowing light and blue, and the expression on his face was that of devotion. Yes, my love. I want all of it. Don't stop until you've busted all your seed deep inside this body. I want to feel it in me. Every last drop, I whispered. He smiled and pressed his forehead against mine. Our eyes locked. The sweet sweat of his blood dripped all over me. His cock was pulsating with every penetration. I tightened my legs around his waist and dug my claws into his back. I... I'm coming, shouted Azora. Shade and I turned our attention to them for a moment. Elisa lay flat on her stomach, as this tattooed beast of a vampire pounded her from behind. Her backside was arched into him, and the sound of their skin slapping together was damn near hypnotic. Azora took hold of her neck and squeezed gently. They were panting deeply, and sweat covered their bodies. Elisa's hair had fully engulfed Azora's face, but he didn't care. She put one of her hands on his hip, and motioned him in and out. Azora's muscles flexed as he hissed with passion. Do it, Azora. I'm ready to carry your child, 
said Elisa. Can I? Can I? Azora's voice was thunderous, as were his strokes. Y yes, I'm, I'm ready. We'll come together, she said. With one final push, they both released an ear-piercing scream at the moment of climax. Azora sank his cock deep inside her, to ensure every drop of his seed became a part of Elisa. Their bodies shook with fury, which forced him to collapse on top of her, both of them out of breath and wholly exhausted. Shade turned my head to face him, and drove his tongue into my mouth. I sucked on his sweet saliva, and squeezed him tighter between my thighs. I felt his muscled ass on the heels of my feet. With every penetration, my blood became that much hotter. Are you ready to receive me, princess? I don't know how much longer I can resist. Every ounce of my being is telling me to give you all that I have, he said. I, I'm going to come, Shade. I want to soak your cock with my juices. Is that okay? Can I do that? I asked desperately. Once again, he rammed his tongue into my mouth and began pounding me like a blood-enraged beast. Our bodies bounced off the surface of the bed with every motion. We felt Elisa and Azora watching, but that didn't deter us from continuing. No more words would be spoken between us, not until we'd come. Shade squeezed my backside tighter and dug his claws into me. I was too lost in the trance of the feeling to care if I was bleeding or not. Shade's moaning made me hotter, and I was begging for more. Our tongues and bodies were locked. The harder he fucked me, the stronger and larger his cock became. Holding myself together was futile at this point. All my senses heightened. I was about to reach my peak. Shade's cock throbbed with every insertion. I knew he was close to climax, as was I. When he tried to pull his mouth away from mine, I wrapped my arms around his head and continued to suck his tongue. There was no letting go until we both exploded. My skin began to glow violet. The vampiric essence of my powers was consuming me. Shade's body shook furiously. He bit my bottom lip and slammed his cock deep in my pussy, shooting a seed inside me. My legs shivered, my skin illuminated, and all that I was exploded in climax. The gods couldn't describe how I felt. Nirvana was me. In Shade, I had found my peace. I opened my eyes and stared into Shade's soul. We both gasped for air, soaked in sweat. I... I love you, Athanasia, he said. And I love... I started to say, but a tingling in my belly interrupted me. The sensation exploded throughout my body, causing my hair to shine red and gold. It was then the Seraph revealed himself unto the vampire, and she was filled with light, an omnipotent presence of universal magnitude. By her own hand, she acknowledged the prophecy to come, beautiful yet daunting, and the Seraph told her what needed to be done. The vampire soaked in lustful ambience, cleaning herself of centuries of death and destruction. For the Seraph knew her destiny served a higher purpose. Once again, he touched her bosom and stirred a pulse in her cold, dead heart. That day she knew the vampire would be born again in the rule of three. I jumped to my feet and almost knocked Shade off the bed in the process. A voice reverberated in my mind, the same way it had when I was in space. Are you okay? asked Shade, wide-eyed. My body was trembling, and my skin illuminated red and gold, the same as my hair. Princess? asked Elisa. She and Dezora stopped their lovemaking and turned their attention on me. All three of them stared at me, shocked as I began to float inches from the bed in a red glowing aura. The gods were calling to me, and there was no way for me to stop this ascension. Athanasia! cried Shade. Higher into the air, I drifted until I felt the warm crystal of the chandelier touch the top of my head. My body felt as if it were in a perpetual state of orgasmic bliss. An otherworldly nirvana was overwhelming my senses. I couldn't do anything but allow it to happen. And the Seraph acted on the command of the Omni, touching the vampire's mind and soul. The changes in her became that of Providence. She would allow the purge to begin. For the vampire knew in every fiber of her being 
that she would transcend all mortals and immortals to become a creator of worlds, said the divine voice. What are you? What do you want from me? I screamed in my mind. I received no answer. My body shimmered and became transparent. Now floating past the chandelier, my bones and flesh were like an apparition as I flew through the ceiling and walls of the palace. I soon found myself looking down at my home from the sky like a goddess. Where are you taking me? The deity stifled my will to speak from the tongue, and the only communication I had was through my thought. I am here, and I am everywhere. You wanted to know what was happening to you. Well, here's your answer. No, I don't want this. I don't want my universe to end, I cried. Sympathy, compassion, and love. Emotions that were foreign to you just a few days ago are now finding their way into your soul. You are the vampire. There must be balance within you. With the death of your dual universe will come the birth of ten. Blood, lust, desire, hunger. These are the traits needed to begin the rule of three. You have what I lack, as deemed by the Omni. I will never yield to a conqueror, no matter how powerful, I protested. Both our destinies were shaped billions of years ago, vampire. Together, we will bring forth the human. Human? What the hell is a human? You will discover the truth to your existence soon enough. A beam of light struck me from a distant star above, filling me with energy and power, far beyond what my uncle had bestowed upon me after my victory in the royal challenge. And the Seraph gave the vampire new meaning, a new purpose. It was there, she realized where the light shone brightest. And for a moment, the vampire was blinded, said the deity. Awe-inspiring melodies sounded all around me. A domain of bliss and compassion opened before my eyes. There, I saw my father. His image was as bright as a supernova in the far reaches of space. He waved to me before entering the domain I held my sights on. Wait, come back, I begged, but it was as if he couldn't hear me. He soon vanished as the light consumed him whole. Th this this isn't real. I'm dreaming. This can't be real. I said over and over again in my head. The nature of reality is revealed to you, vampire. The Omni's universe awaits once you've settled your affairs on your world. Everything must fall into place at the right moment. Soon, you will see. The skin on my body illuminated white and my hair shone with bright red and black colors. It felt as if I were making love to a god. What was this feeling? What was happening to me? You will be able to unlock your power the day we are joined as two. And that power will increase beyond your imagination once we are three. The beam of radiance from the star ceased, and I was jettisoned back to the surface of my world at the speed of sound. The gods were calling. I was at the center of not only my empire, but also the universe. I had to find out the purpose of this entity, as well as why it chose me. Seconds before I struck the ground, a red aura surrounded my body and floated me to the white grass in the forest right outside the palace. The sensation paralyzed me. I couldn't speak or move. A figure with massive gold wings descended upon me and smiled. It was beautiful. Soon, we will be two. Together, we will create worlds, the entity said aloud. Feeling began in my right arm and trickled its way through me, and I was able to move slightly. I raised my right hand toward the entity and pointed my index finger. With an almost blinding light, the entity reached for me and touched my finger with its own. A sudden rush of energy pulsated through me, in what I could only describe as an undying perpetual climax of cosmic magnitude. And I leave you here to contemplate my words. When the time arises, I will come for you. The entity levitated higher into the air. The force of peace and love that came with it soon faded from me. Wait! When will I know? I pleaded for an answer, still resting on the flat grass. You will know, vampire. You will know. The entity shot into the air and vanished, leaving me there, along with hundreds of questions. I still couldn't bring myself to stand. The feeling of its touch had me in awe. I put my arm back at my side and closed my eyes. Why was this happening? As I lay there, I let my mind drift. 
something was coming, and I didn't understand why or how. I needed to think, but most of all, I needed to rest. The event had exhausted me upon anything I'd felt before. I exhaled slowly and slept on the warm, delicate grass. The silence was calming, and it was what I needed. I'd find the truth soon enough, and I would reveal whatever secrets were being kept from me eventually, and those of the entity, as well as my auntie. Now, however, rest was calling. As long as no one knew I was out here, I'd be able to get some much-needed repose. Everything was coming together. The next time that entity and I met, I would have to convince it to spare my universe. Either that, or destroy it with all the powers bestowed upon me. I'd fight to the death for my empire, my race, and my universe. No matter who stood in the way, I took one last deep breath and fell into slumber. Time was waning, and I had much to do. I asked the gods for the power and the will to see me through what lay ahead. That was all I could do. The power dwelled within me, and it was my hope that was all it would take to be victorious. My empire, no, my universe, depended on it. me.